Why would a distributor become a filmmaker? Isn't there more money in film distribution than there is in making movies? That's a great question. And a lot of my distribution associates thought I was nuts when I went that direction. But filmmaking is about the making of movies. You know, the distribution is, is, is a business and it's, it could be a very lucrative business and, and fun and I enjoyed it a lot. But my heart was always, I went into the film business to make movies. And I started in distribution in some ways by accident because I went to get a, a production job and the only job they had available in the company that I got hired into was a sales job in the distribution department. So I figured to get my foot in the door, I would take that job in the hopes of moving over into the production department. I mean, that lasted 22 years. And in hindsight, I learned a ton and, and it was super valuable so that I could, you know, be successful in making my own movies and distributing them. But that was only in hindsight. If somebody had come into my office, you know, six months into my distribution job and said, hey, we have an opening in production, I would have taken it immediately um, because my heart always was in making independent movies. So the truth is, I think the attraction to the film business is making the movies. But you had gone to law school, you were practicing law or you just had your JD and you'd come from Canada? Yeah. So here's how that happened. So when I was in my last year of high school, my father said to me, he said, what do you think you want to do in your life? And I said, I want to make movies. And he said, do you want to produce or direct? And I said, I don't know, what's the difference? And he said, well, producing is all about business. So if you want to produce, you should either get a law degree or a business degree. And if you want to direct, you should go to film school because it's all about art and you should get a you know film degree. And I said, yeah, producing sounds kind of cool. So, so I went, I did an undergrad in finance and commerce and, I, and then I went to law school in, with the 100% idea and direction that I was going, going to, into the film business to produce. That was the reason I went to law school. I never had any intentions of practicing law unless it was for a studio or something related to film. Ah, so your goal was not to do litigation and, and you know. Never. Okay. I went to film school with the right. intention of producing movies because it's a super, you know, valuable skill to have. And now, now that I've produced seven movies, I, I understand how valuable it is. I mean, in law school, I didn't really realize how much contract work there is you know, and how much IP work and that type of thing that there is in making any movie or any, any type of entertainment content. So it's a great skill to have, like legal skills and, and finance, financial skills are great also. Yeah. What I didn't say is that in hindsight, if my father knew that I was actually going to go into the film business and not become a practicing lawyer, he might have given me some different <laughs> advice. <laughs> no, it worked out fine. When I was in law school, um, I spent a lot of time writing screenplays as opposed to studying for legal exams. And I wasn't the best law student, but I was super happy and I, it gave me a release. And I actually produced two plays, like musicals, with a friend of mine who was uh, in a different division and he was a musician and we wrote and produced two plays, which we staged. So I got to be very creative during law school and I think it got me through law school. Were the screenplays that you wrote based on a you know, mock trials or, you know. So th this is this is sort of a leading question and uh, it's going to go in a different direction. The reason I wanted to get into the film business, one, I love movies, but two, like most filmmakers, I have that one pet project that I had to do in my life. And it was, uh, luckily, I actually got to make it. So it was the first film that I made and it's called My Brother's Keeper. And my grandfather, when we were growing up, um, used to sit me and my brothers on his knee and tell us a story about um, two brothers who had to help each other. My grandfather, you know, was from Europe and he, big on family and all this type of stuff. So he, he probably fabricated the story. We never knew if it was real or not. In, in hindsight, I think it was a fabrication, but it was a great story. And he would tell it to us every Sunday. We would go and sit with him and, and he would tell us. And then he used to pay us 25 cents to tell him the story back. So all of his grandchildren knew the story inside and out because it was his legacy. And I, want, I decided that I wanted to make a movie of that story. And so that is why I really, really wanted to get in the film business to make that particular movie. 
And so when I was in law school, I wrote the script to that movie. And when I graduated from law school, I used that script to send it around to all these production companies to say, hey, either one, um, would you like to make this movie? Or two, you know, do you have a job? And here's what I can do. I'm a writer, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and I got no response like most people do. You know, I'm sure nobody read the script or whatever. And that was, you know, an awakening, which most indie filmmakers get. Um, I mean, it opened the door to say one company said, hey, we see you have a law degree. Um, we don't have a job in production, but you might be useful to us in, you know, in distribution on the sales side. So I took that job. And, but I always, dreamed of making that movie and that that was my direction and my goal in life and I left distribution to make that movie to become to, that was my first movie it's called my brother's keeper I released it 14 years ago and it was oh, sorry in 2004 yeah so 16 years ago now and um, it's it's still it's my dream I got to live my dream which is a wonderful thing in life in in anything you do but I'm a lucky guy, one, that I had a dream, and two, that I actually got to live it. And that movie, every time I watch it, it brings back that feeling of who I was and what I wanted to do. And um, like I say, it's, it's, it's a legacy for me because, and it ends with you know a tribute to my grandfather saying, based on a story that my grandfather told us. And um, I twisted it around a little. I took the story and the themes and I twisted it around with two different characters, two brothers, and I gave it a little bit of a twist. And but I I love it. And the brothers are twins, identical <laughs> twins. That, how did you know? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, so the brothers are identical twins, and uh, the, in his story, the brother the brothers weren't identical twins. But I happened to be an identical twin, so I thought that would be a really unique twist. So that's the twist I gave to it. But the story wasn't originally like that. So um, I made it into that because also the relationship between identical twins is super super unique and very tight. And being an identical twin, I understood it implicitly. Um, I didn't. I wrote the movie and I produced it, but I didn't direct it because I didn't really have any filmmaking skills. You know, I had a lot of business skills, but not filmmaking. But I did hire a director who was an identical twin because I wanted him to capture those sensitivities, which he did. Well, I bet that was was that difficult to find. Um, not as difficult as you might think. Um, Especially, I, I was living in Toronto at the time, and Toronto is a big film hub, and there's a lot of people in the industry. Um, so I put the word out, and uh, there were quite a few, um, not quite a few, maybe you know five or six who identical twins who were so-called directors. You know, like this guy hadn't made a feature before; he'd made some shorts and some TV commercials, but never a feature. So this was his first feature. We were all a little bit green, but it worked out. Did you actually quit a job to make it? So um, I had I started off, um, I had worked primarily for big companies. There's no studios per se in Canada. There's some big media companies, but nothing like, you know, the, the five major studios here, the six majors here. Um, so I worked for a very large public media company for most of my career. Um, I switched around between two of them. Um, and then I left that media company to start my own company, but it was a distribution company. Um, because I also have a very entrepreneurial side to me. So I felt that I had learned the business and I left and started my own company. And so I had access and know-how in distribution. And then about uh, four to five years into owning and operating that company, that's when I said I'm ready to make my this movie. So I still had my own operation, but I switched gears. Um, I had a lot of people in the distribution side who were competent. I still own the company, but but I switched gears and I went into the artistic side, content side. And be, that's what I did full time. And that's when everybody said, are you nuts? He said, like, you have the greatest thing going. You have a great lifestyle. You have a successful business. Why are you doing this? And I said, because I also have a dream. And a dream surpasses everything. You know, I think someone had that same conversation with Jeff Bezos. <laughs> when, he, when he said he wanted to pick up and move from wherever New York City to he wasn't even sure yet I think at the time he and his wife and then they, they he had like this long walk with someone if I remember the chapter in the book correctly and they said what are you doing so sometimes these these different things you know they 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 seem crazy to the outside world whether it was in hindsight worth it but yeah. sometimes people just have to do things it wasn't a financially um, you know it wasn't the best financial move 
but it was by far the best psychological, emotional, and, and comforting move in my life by far. I am, I, I, I honestly, I consider myself so lucky to be able to be in a position where I could green light my own movie the, and make it the way I wanted to make it, a feature. I mean, who gets that opportunity? Not too many people. So sure. I'm, I'm very fortunate that way. And it had an emotional component because it was a story that was very close to your heart. And you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, after I made that movie, I felt totally fulfilled. I felt like I had gotten to where I wanted to go um, in my life, certainly in my career. And then the rest was, it's, it's very um, comforting to have a goal and to accomplish it and to achieve it. Now, it didn't, you know, it wasn't a financially huge success. It made, it made some money because I was in distribution. So I knew how to, I knew how to monetize it. Um, but I would have made it anyways, even if it wasn't monetizable. I, I, I had to make that movie. That was, that was a must for me. Jeff, you say making a movie is like starting a new business. Why make that comparison? Making an independent movie. Um, there's so much to it. I mean, there's so many components to making a movie. Think of you're creating something um, from scratch, from an idea. So, and that's what a business is. You have an idea and you want to bring it to life and bring whatever it is, your product or service to market. And you have to go through all those steps and components in order to do that. I mean, that's what making a movie is. Um, ultimately, you're going to develop it, produce it, mar and then market it. And so that's what a business is. It's creating like a product or a service and then putting it out to market and hoping that consumers consume it. And in the case of a movie, it's the consumption is watching it or buying it, you know, whatever in that case. Um, so how is that any different than any business? That's what all businesses do. They create from an idea, a product or service and put it out to market to be consumed. And that's why I relate it to a business. Now, in, in the studios, this, there's two types of, I, I believe that the studio business and the independent business are actually two separate businesses. The way a public company would be different than an entrepreneurial company. So let's deal with the public company. So a public company has shareholders and they have a responsibility and a mandate to earn revenue for, you know, and um, dividends or whatever for their shareholders. That's their mission. Their mission is to create wealth so that they can distribute it to their shareholders. Um, so everybody's focused on that, on wealth creation and, you know, and whatever it takes to be profitable. That's why corporations exist, especially public corporations. In the case of a, so that's what a studio is. I mean, every studio is a public company. So every studio has to be financially successful for two reasons. One, if they're not, they can't exist and make the products they want to do. And two is their shareholders wouldn't support it. So the studios are public companies and they are financial institutions that create wealth. That's the way I look at them. They happen to be, the product they happen to be making is, you know, entertainment, movies, TV shows, whatever. Um, but it's for the reason of generating profit. There's not many studio people I've met who will say to you, I want to do this because this is what I like and enjoy and it doesn't matter if we make profit. They won't last too long in the studio system. They have to be profit oriented. On the entrepreneurial side, which is what I would relate to the indie filmmaking business, um, you also, if you want to exist and continue, you, you do have to make a profit like any business. Um, but you can take more risks, the stakes are not lower and you're not you're not accountable to anybody other than yourself and your investors. On, a, on the public company side, you're accountable to all your shareholders. Here, the accountability factor is less. So you don't want to blow your brains out and lose all your investors' money or whoever it is. It might just be your own money and your own time. But you're, you have the ability to take more risks, which is what an entrepreneur does. Um, maybe have a little bit more fun. Maybe go a little bit more passion. Do the things that you truly want to do. Like when I speak to filmmakers, um, the two questions they always ask me is, what genre of film should I make that would be most saleable? And that's question number, and I answer that question and I say, great question, but let me ask you a question before I answer your question. What genre of film do you like to make? See, in a studio, you'd never have that discussion. That would be, we need to make, here's what's trending, here's what's happening in the marketplace, here's what we're forecasting, this is where we're gonna make the most amount of money. 
in the entree, nobody says, hey, what do you think we should do? What would be the most fun? What would be like the most artistic? In the entrepreneurial world, you can have that conversation. Art actually matters. I mean, you know, listen, in the studio world, you have to make good product. It has to be fantastic and very artistic in order for people to be entertained by it. But they don't have the luxury of picking and choosing the way an entrepreneur does. Because they're, again, they're accountable to a smaller group of people. So, but on the business side, why I relate it to a business is because when you decide to make a movie from start to finish, um, if you want to be a, what I call a career filmmaker who makes just more than one movie, um, it would be helpful if you were profitable because that way, one, you'd have enough money, you'd make your money back, which would help to make your next movie. Two, that would evoke investor confidence. If you are dealing with investors, they would say, hey, this guy is you know, able to make money with the stuff we're investing in. So, so it does make it a lot easier if you're profitable on the entrepreneurial side. Um, but you don't have to necessarily be profitable because, I mean, it might not lead to a good career, um, but you could be what, you know, a hobby filmmaker or just an artist who says, I have a statement that I want to make to the world and I'm going to do it through a movie. And it's important for me, this is, this is the kind of movie I want to make. This is the artistic integrity that I, and I don't really want to compromise. So I'm not really worried about what the audience thinks. I'm more worried about what I think. I personally don't think that makes for necessarily great business practice because it might not generate the profit that you're looking for. Um, but an entrepreneur gets to do that. That's part of being in business. And you know, if you look at the statistics of entrepreneurs, most small businesses fail miserably. Um, it's really, really tough to navigate opening a new business. That would be the same with indie films. Um, the good news about making indie film is even though you didn't make any money and you could say it sort of failed financially, it didn't necessarily fail artistically. So you left, you're going to leave the world with your legacy and your message and whatever, and hopefully audiences will enjoy it. Maybe they didn't pay for it, but hopefully they'll enjoy it. So at least you get that out of it. Whereas a failed business on the entrepreneurial side, you know, let's say open a restaurant or a clothing store or something like that, and it fails, I mean, you're just left with a lot of debt and a lot of aggravation. Right. That's, that was actually, I was going to bring up the next thing is, is certain businesses, of course, and I was wondering if we could make that comparison to certain types of movies. So if you have a, a, a restaurant, which, what is it, 90% failure rate? I'm not sure if that, that's the right percentage. Yeah. But then versus, you say, someone selling widgets and it's, it's LED lights and it's all the rage. Uh, are certain movies in the category of the restaurant and certain movies are in the category of the widgets? Um, I would look at it a little differently. Um, because you know certain restaurants in certain locations I think have a better chance than other restaurants in other locations so so I would say certain the, the, it, there's a trend in the movie business you know as you know like sometimes horror movies are the hot rage sometimes it's sci-fi um, I and there's you definitely if you're in it to make money if you're in the film business to make money you definitely have to consider what your audience wants to see and who your audience actually is. And that was the second question. Like I always said, they say, you know, what, what film should I make? And the second question is actually, how do I get it to the audience? So the first way to get a film to an audience is to identify who the audience is, which means you have to choose the genre of film that you are going to aim at your audience. So for example, I tend to make family films. I like family films, I enjoy making them, I enjoy the genre, I have four kids, they were growing up, it was a nice thing for me to do, but I did it because I really enjoy family films. So, and then within family films, I'm very specific, my films are very specific, they're generally sports dramas based on true stories, because I love that genre, and it's very, very marketable. Especially each one has a, <laughs> a defined market. So, like I've made two gymnastics films, so I can go to the gymnastics world and I'm able to actually target market gymnasts and dancers. Um, so I don't have to go generically across the whole gambit to try to market to everybody. I can specifically hone my marketing efforts in on, you know, gymnasts and dancers who I would think would be engaged by the movie, for, by these particular movies, which has worked. Um, so as a business decision, it does help to to identify the audience that you want to go to and then, you know, choose the movie that hopefully will cater to that audience 
or vice versa, if you're gonna choose a movie, make sure you identify how you're gonna, who the audience is and how you're gonna market to them before you make the, the movie. Otherwise, you, it's hard to do it after the fact. You gotta have, I mean, this is what studios do. I mean, I'm convinced, I've never worked at a studio, but I'm 100% convinced that if the marketing department doesn't green light the movie, then the production department's not making it. They need to know who that's going to, how it's gonna get marketed, what the plan's gonna be in order to monetize you know, the product they make. And indie film producers generally don't do that, but if they did do that, then it kind of like a restaurateur opening a restaurant. Like if you're gonna open, say, um, an Indian restaurant in an Asian marketplace, it could be, it could be tricky. I don't know, maybe Asian people like Indian food. Um, but you better do your research and make sure they do. Otherwise, your restaurant could be fantastic. It just might be in the wrong place. And that's the same with a film. Like, you know, if you're gonna make a film that caters to a certain audience and you haven't really identified who the audience is or how to get to them, you could make the greatest film of all time. But it's gonna be hard to get it to your audience. You know, and you had mentioned earlier, and I love this point that you're making, um, about clothing. And it brings back uh, uh, something I watched about Diane von Furstenberg and her wrap dress which was all the rage, I think it was late 70s, 80s. And then I think she got in trouble because she went and bought a new inventory and it was so popular, but taste had changed, if I remember correctly. So she had all this inventory that was not selling at the time. I think it made a resurgence later. But do audiences, that, that's the thing. If, if we know the rage is horror movies with a certain soundtrack and different things, mm -hmm. can the audience change and now you've got this this excess surplus. I have a maybe a bit of a skewed opinion about that. So I believe that anything that is unique, good, and really entertaining will can actually create a trend itself and can find an audience. And you know, it's funny, I notice over the years, especially with studio pictures, that's always with studio movies. Um, trends seem to develop, like, you know, you know, in the 70s you had the Star Wars, Star Trek, all these star, you know, space themes, right? Like, that doesn't just come out of nowhere. So I've always thought about, like, how does a trend like that develop? Do people, like audience members or, whatever, you know, consumers write into studios and say, hey, we want to see star movies? Like, they don't. Here's how I think it develops. I think that, that creative people develop these stories, and then they go pitch them to studio execs. And, um, you know, in the case of, again, I just read about Lucas and Star Wars, so I don't know for sure, I've never met Lucas, I've never interviewed him, but, but it's, you know, he, he says in his book that he went to everybody. He knocked on every single door many times and got rejected with Star Wars. Um, but every time, because I worked in big media companies, but every time a filmmaker walks out the door after they pitched a crazy unique concept, they leave and the, and the executives in the room say, yeah, it was crazy, but, but what if like, you know, like at Warner Brothers, they say, what if Paramount takes it and we're wrong? Like, what about this? So you notice that like when one movie comes out, five movies come out, and I think it's because nobody wants to be wrong. So they have to cover themselves and make sure they have something else to offer. Um, because why all of a sudden do five star movies, the Star Wars movies or related type of stuff come out? Why all of a sudden is there a, a run on horror movies or run on westerns or romantic comedies or stuff like that? Like there's generally a run on them. And generally, you know, I mean, the movie business is driven by the studios and the big movies, the theatrical movies. And I think there's a run on them because every studio doesn't want to be wrong. So they have to hedge their bets to make sure that whoever greenlit whatever they did, and they didn't green light it, they have something to cover. That's my theory, okay? It's a conspiracy theory. That's what I believe to be true. Because it's just too random that everybody would be looking at the same stuff at the same time randomly. So I feel like that's how it happens. Now, there are genres that are evergreen. I personally think family is an evergreen genre. That's one of the reasons I work in it. Because as long as there's families, as long as there's kids that grow up and want to, you know, their parents want to view movies together, there needs to be family movies. So I believe that's evergreen. Um, most genres are evergreen; just some are trending more than others. But the way the way that clothing trends and cars trend and that type of thing, 
I believe it's all based on marketing and I believe the studios sort of decide what the audience is going to see and when they're going to see it. It's not the audiences who demand something. The studios say, we're going to now move it into this genre. We're going to release 10 horror films. We're going to release 10 rom-coms or whatever. And that's what we're doing because I'm not sure why <laughs> that's what we're doing and which makes a trend develop or die. That's a great point. Like found footage. So Blair Witch and it seemed like it, it, it tipped off other found footage films and it became all the rage after a while. It did but you know in order for a trend to develop it's not necessarily only part of it is what people are making. It's primarily what is being released by studios. So there could be you know 10 of those kind of Blair Witch style movies. Um, the first one happened to be successful so they might as well run a few more and see how that goes. But if if the second and third are not successful you can be sure that's going to die very quickly as quickly as it started. So th the trends really go with the profit. Like they put them out they see what happens if it makes profit then they go with more and more until they exhaust it and then they have to come with something else. It's kind of like fashion I think. Does a movie start with an idea or does it start with an audience? Mm, depends who you ask. Um, I would say an idea and then the and then you would gauge whether there's an audience for that idea. Um, but if you do have an audience and you want to cater to that audience and there's demand then you create an idea to cater to it. N not unlike a product, right? Let's say that uh, and again let's use Apple as an example, okay? You know the founders of Apple said, hey the computer market is new and we need something that's super user friendly. That's what the audience, the consumers want. They want super, super friendly. So then they create, I think then they create a product to cater to that demand as opposed to, hey, we're going to make a super, well, mind you, I guess it could go either way. We're going to make a super friendly, user friendly computer and we suspect that the consuming base will re really love it. So it, I guess it could go either way. Whereas you know, with the case of a movie, generally independent films start with an idea um, because independent filmmakers are artists and they want to express their artistic you know, sensitivities and that type of thing. So they'll, they'll say, this is what I want to do and I'll make a movie to do it. And unfortunately, not enough of them think about who the audience is going to be afterwards and then it's really hard to get to that audience. Um, I would think studios though would say, hey, feels like like we talked about before there's some trending going on in you know horror films or sci-fis and so let's let's get some sci-fi ideas in here. Let's make a couple more of those because it feels like that's the way the market's going to go for a bit. And then when the idea has brought such an audience hence sequels happen and then it almost seems like the original idea gets cheapened in a sense toward the end of the sequel run. Maybe I'm wrong. How does that happen? How does this precious idea that garnered this audience then through many iterations become it's like okay I think they 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 I don't want to say beat a dead horse but you know in that and that they, 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 they took too long with it or there's too many they tried too hard and it ruined that original concept maybe yeah. not. Sequels are are you know a component of marketing. I mean when something works why not capitalize on it and make some more money off of it. So hence a sequel that's what it is. I mean you know you have a product that is working really well bring out the second edition of it. You know iPhone worked well bring out iPhone 2, bring out iPhone 3, bring out iPhone 4. Why not? You got the market. They want more, better, greater. Just keep giving it to them. In the case of a sequel in movies um, you use the word cheapen. I could give you lots of examples where the sequel is actually better than the original one and I would say that you know Empire Strikes Back with Star Wars was a better movie than Star Wars. Um, it needed Star Wars to get it going but that was a far more entertaining movie and that's because now the concept was proven and the studio was prepared to spend more money and maybe give a little more creative control to the producers and the directors and that type of thing so hence they had more resources to make a better movie. But you are right in a lot of cases it becomes cheaper because they're just trying to capitalize on you know a trend that they built and it just throw it out their similar style and, and not really think about it as much and it's not as artistic. But the bottom line is they work. 
I mean, statistically, if you look at the numbers and the economics behind it, sequels generate a lot of money. Um, and, you know, maybe not as much as the first one, maybe sometimes more. I mean, look at the Rocky franchise. Um, they just kept being bigger and bigger and bigger, those movies. So why not? It's the same story. You tell it over a few times, but it's a good story. And people like it. So if you get people invested in the characters and the idea and you take them on that ride, and it works sometimes then. It's not always about, it doesn't always cheapen it. It's about the audience. I mean, if you're focused on the audience and the audience is enjoying it and that's what they want, then I wouldn't use the word cheap in it. It's you're just giving them more of what they want. Artistically, you know, if you're talking about an artist, an artist might say you've compromised your artistic integrity by, you know, just copying the same thing over and over and over. And that would be correct. But for the studios, it's primarily about profit. So why not get more of the same? They're predictable. And do you think that studios bank on the fact that the audience will age and they can go along with these sequels or they know that there are going to be new audiences cropping up, the, the descendants of the original audience? Yeah. Born well, I mean, it's funny I just mentioned Rocky because that's a perfect example of what you're talking about. Because they, they, I think it was the five Rocky movies and then, you know, years later they come out with Creed. So, and Creed is, you know, Apollo Creed, the character from the first movie, his son. Now they have a whole new line of movies based on that. So would you call that a sequel or what would that be? Mm. It's an ancillary product that came out of a very successful franchise. And so they're creating a second franchise out of a first franchise, which I think is super smart. And, you know, like, so we grew up with Rocky, right? Um, I don't enjoy the Creed movies as much as the Rocky movies, but my kids do. My kids like them way better because that's the new hero. You know, the, the, he's younger, he's got a certain personality that they relate to more than, you know, than Rocky. Sure, so, times change, yeah. So do, do I necessarily, does it cater to me? No, but, but it caters to a younger audience that, you know, sort of capitalizes on the same thing that they capitalize on us with Rocky. Sure. And it works well. What do you think about the sentence, don't write for the market? <laughs> I'm not a typical filmmaker. I come from the business side of the filmmaking industry. Like I told you, I didn't go to film school. I went to business school, law school. So, um, and I wouldn't, I'm not going to say that I'm not artistic because I am. And I really, really care about the creative process and the artistic integrity. That Very, very much so. Because you don't want to cheapen the product. And you, I take a lot of pride in the stuff that I do. But don't write for the audience. Like, who are you writing for if it's not for the audience? If it's for your, I mean, yeah, if you want to write for yourself, no problem. But if you want your movies to be successful and you want, you know, to make a career out of it and, and you know, and be financially comfortable, you got to consider the audience. I mean, they're the people paying for it to consume it. Again, if you have the luxury of not worrying about that and not having to make a living from it, then write for whoever you want, write for yourself. But if you have to, make a living from your audience because you want them to pay to consume your product, you better cater to them. What about the purists, though, that feel that their creation is, is and I'm, I'm using cheap and too much, so I'm going to try to find a new word, but that it's being tainted. compromised. Oh, compromised. compromised. I like that. Yeah, That's yeah, good. Yeah. Compromised and, and, and changed by too many hands, then maybe is, is just making films for, for those that are so precious about their ideas and they don't want too many, you know, whether it's a test audience, yeah. um, you know, change this part here, that maybe that it's just best to make the film in the sense the way you made your first film uh, with your grandfather's story, that it was something that you needed to do and you really fe felt contentment after you finished it, but you weren't there to try to sell it in terms of it wasn't supposed to be this million dollar idea. Right. And, and that there are two kinds of filmmakers and that that's okay. Yeah, it's so, definitely okay. Mm -hmm. But um, again, it depends what financial comfort and luxury you have in your life. If you're doing this to make a living, then you have to focus on the audience. If, you're, if you don't, it's not about making a living, but it's, it's an artistic endeavor that's either a hobby or something that it's not going to change your life and you don't need it to make income, then yeah, you have to do whatever you want to do. But here's the advice I would definitely give to independent filmmakers. 
um, if you really have a message and, and you do have to make a living from it, but you really want to maintain that artistic integrity, which I highly recommend you do, write a book. Don't make a movie. A book is so much cheaper to write and to publish than it is to make a movie. So why put yourself in that financial predicament of making a movie? Just write a book and, and, and express yourself exactly the way you want it to and you'll have it forever and the world will have it and maybe you'll make a movie someday of it. Um, now there are filmmakers who do have the luxury either by happenstance or like coincidence or, or they were born into it or whatever, um, have the luxury of doing whatever they want to do which is fantastic. And when they do that, um, sometimes it's absolutely brilliant. When they have no financial you know, considerations or no directions or whatever, they get to do what they want to do. Um, it doesn't happen often but you know, th it does happen after you've had a lot of success. Like, like Tarantino, nobody's going to tell him how to make a movie anymore and I'm not sure maybe the studios didn't tell him at the beginning but um, when you have that proven success and people you know, are willing to bank on your raw talent, that's great. But usually out of the gate with independent filmmakers, I mean a lot of them do have that great raw talent and, and, and can hit a home run the first time around but people don't know it and it's, it's super risky. So making a, a movie and I'm talking, when I say make a movie, I'm not talking you know, 50,000 or 100,000, I'm talking you know, 800,000, 900 million dollars or whatever, there's real money involved and somebody's going to lose a lot of money and if they can afford to and they say no problem, no problem, great, that's fantastic. But if there's, if people's you know, financial comfort is at stake, I'd say the audience, you got to really keep that in consideration. You know, you brought up book and forgive me, I'm reading this book about J.D. Salinger right now and this woman who, who had a, a job at an agency answering his fan mail and to see that his fan mail spanned generations and it was so, it was so much that they couldn't even give it to him. He, he, had to, he, he had sort of a shield up because he'd created something that resonated with so many generations of people right. and that's something he probably didn't intend on having happen. He wrote it sort of out of his own angst and being in the war and different things like that. But that's one example of, of probably not intending to write for a market but somehow it was lightning in a bottle. How, how rare is that? I don't know for sure because I would say most independent writers and, produ and, and, and directors and, you know, do write for what the artistic merit of it. They have something that they want to express and, and they just write it. Um, so I did that. I mean that's what I did with my first movie. I wrote the script the way I wanted it. I didn't have to answer to any studio execs or anything. I just had to answer to myself. I did it how I wanted to. Now if I were to do it again, do a remake of it, I would probably do it a little differently. I would make it more audience friendly. I would make the, I would pace it a little differently. I would cut it a little differently. I would make it, you know, a little bit more audience friendly because the audience, now I understand the audience better. After my brother's he, keeper, sorry. Yeah, my brother's keeper, so I was to make that again. So, you know, the first time around, you tend to believe that what you're going to make is going to be so artistically sound that it will resonate with audiences and you don't really have to pay attention to them. You just have to be as creative as, and, you know, as possible. Um, and, and it does work sometimes, it does. But there are some trends and some, you know, things that people have learned along the way that also work that would be good to take into consideration. But it, you know, artists could say that that is a compromise. But do you think that that's good that you had that experience and that you knew a story you had to get out there for your own personal reasons and now you can resonate with a lot of filmmakers who you probably have to have that talk with them because they, they, it's, they're precious with their idea but you also know that they need to sell certain territories and that might not work in a territory. Yeah. Remember I had the, like I said, you know, the financial luxury of owning my own business and being financially comfortable. So I wouldn't have, I had also had four kids. So I would not have done that had I not had financial comfort behind me. It, it wasn't going to change my lifestyle. But if it was, if I, I wasn't going to prepare, listen, I, I had a dream and I wanted to live it but I wasn't prepared to roll the dice on the rest of my life, on my family and my house and everything like that. Um, that's still more important to me. 
So um, I guess I'm just that kind of guy. I'm super responsible that way, and I like to find the balance of living my dreams and how. And one of my dreams is having a nice family and a nice family life, right? So I got to keep that in balance. Um, if you have that in your life, then do what you need to do. Like just do it your way. Stay the vision. Do it exactly how you want to do it. And so, because at the end of the day, I mean, two things are going to happen. One is it's either going to be financially successful or not. But the at the end of the day, what is most important is when you look back on that. That's your legacy in your life. You have to feel really good. You can't second guess yourself for the rest of your life saying, oh, if I would have stuck to my vision or if I would have done this or I would have done that. I mean, you have to say, this is what I wanted to do in my life. This is why I'm doing it. This is my dream. I'm sacrificing so much else. I want to keep the artistic integrity because that's what I want to do. That's the message I want to do. So I strongly, strongly encourage that. It's not, you see, it's the, the question is, what is a compromise? Everybody has a different level where they draw that line, right? So for me, if you know, if here's 100%, if I compromise 20% and I keep the other 80% intact, I feel okay. I feel that that wasn't too big of a compromise because I know why I did that. I'm going after a certain audience and I need to pace it differently or I need to add a subplot in or I need to do something that I wouldn't otherwise do artistically. I don't like I'm never going to regret that decision because I have that financial business side of me saying, I know why I did it. I did it because I wanted to try to, to reach the audience. But if you're an artist who that will bother you the rest of your life, then don't do it. Don't do it and hope that what you've done will resonate with your audience. Because at the end of the day, you never know for sure. You can follow patterns, but nothing's for sure, for sure. It's not set in stone. Sure. And, and some people live by this motto that they don't want to be a sellout. I know it gets a lot of. I mean, that spans yeah. generations. The sell, whether it's a music, um, um, you know, writing, uh, film. But some people, you, you said being okay with that twenty percent. Some people might consider that twenty percent selling out. Oh, 100, totally. Yeah. I mean, some people might consider one percent selling out. And you, so you have to know who you are, and you got to feel confident. It's like I said, when all is said and done, I mean, the, the litmus test, the true litmus test, is five years later. How do you feel about what you did? Not two months later, not six months later, because you know you're going through. Let it sit, and five years later, come back to it. Watch it again. How do you feel about it? Do you feel like you sold out? Do you feel that you made a mistake? That you did something wrong? That's about knowing yourself, and everybody has a different sort of level at which they deal with. Um, so, I would never sell myself out, like. Here's the here's the classic example of that, a, a studio or or you know or distributor some some corporation in the film industry says, wow, we read your script and we like it and we want to make it, but we don't want you to direct it. We want to put another director on, and that other director is going to have artistic, um, you know, decision making on it. That is tricky, right? Because you want your movie made, you want your story being told, you wrote your script, you love it, but. Nine times out of ten, they're not going to tell it the way you told it. And then sometimes they might tell it better, but usually you're going to feel compromise. So is that a compromise that's worth doing? I mean, here on the one side, you're getting your movie made. It's a dream. Your script, you're getting paid for it. You're going to see it come to life. But on the other side, you don't get to. To it's like having a baby and giving that baby to someone else to raise it. So you love the baby. You're always going to love the baby. But you don't like the direction they raised it. Is that a compromise? Depends who you are and depends what you feel. If you feel it's a compromise, then don't do it. If you feel it's not, then do it. And it's 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 all per, it's very personal decision. Script or budget? What should someone think of first when producing a film? Karen, I love your questions. I really do. The business side of me says budget, but you can't ever deny script. Script is. Look at here's what I say to filmmakers. I say you got to be cognizant of how much you spend because there's only so much you can make back. But don't if you if you want to make money with a movie, don't make a bad movie. Like there's no point in doing something that's not going to entertain an audience. If it's if it's a piece of crap, then if you're doing it because you want to practice, fine. But if you're doing it because you really want to try to give yourself a shot. Don't do a bad movie. 
because a bad movie can't sell. It's just so you can't compromise on script for the sake of budget. But there's a range, you see? Script is not just here, it's a range. It could be, this is good enough, this is fantastic. So maybe you, you, you hopefully end up in the middle or somewhere here. But you know, at some point you have to say, okay, I can't afford all the things I want in here because my budget won't allow me all these explosions or gunshots or you know, in the case of an action movie, all the stuff you want to stick in here. But I have enough story here where I'm prepared to go at this level and I feel like I can make a good, solid, entertaining movie. In the case of budget though, you see, if you want to make your money back, there are certain realities to the marketplace that there's certain levels where it's tried and true that you're only going to make a certain amount back on certain levels of movies. Like for instance, if you're not using A-level talent, you're just using no-name talent, it peaks out at a certain level. Unless, you know, we're t I'm not talking about the anomalies, the home runs that come out of left field that you, you, nobody expects it, okay? I'm talking about the regular everyday movies, all right? For the most part, you're only going to get back, say, this amount of money for, for, for a budget at this level. Like you make a million dollar movie, chances are the highest prospect you have is a million and a half dollars out there. If you, and if you think that's a million and a half is what I can really get, once you creep, you start creeping that budget up to a million, two, three, four, five, or go over that, even if you are super successful, the market won't bear anything more than that. Therefore, you're putting yourself in a predicament where you probably won't make money where you could have made money if you stuck to that million dollar budget. Now, then it becomes a script. Like, you're a filmmaker, there's the integrity. I need that one extra explosion. I need that one extra big scene, you know, to make this movie more epic and maybe win an award or something like that. And maybe it does make the movie better, but I'm not sure it increases the revenue on the back end until you get into sort of the next category of film. So I tend to lean, budget is always the controlling factor because, because I don't want to lose money. But script is a very, very, they're, they're related, right? What can you do? It's basically the question always is, here's how much money realistically you have to spend, either because that's what investors gave you or that's, you don't want to spend more because that's what you can earn back. What can I do in this story for that amount of money? Will I feel compromised that I couldn't do enough? Don't make that movie then. Let me see if I understand this. So if I have a film and I know that the budget is a million dollars, great, stay at that level because there's, there's a chance I couldn't re recoup my investor's money and, and, and make a profit. But if I start to move the needle and do a few more things here and we're going up now 200,000, now I'm putting that money at risk. I, there's a chance that that's not going to be a safe investment. But if I had a, uh, what would be the higher, the next higher step, so, two million? Yeah, it's categories. So first of all, and, and again, it's not a perfect science. It's just based on my experience, right? So this a classic filmmaker will say, you know, like let's use a million dollars, right? You're making an action film for a million dollars, all right? You really want two million dollars because you want to add in all these other big, you know, special effects and stuff like that, but you don't have it. The distributor says a million and a half is the realistic place that we're, the revenue that we're going to get for this movie. So try to keep it there. Once you start spending that extra, they, then you, here's what a filmmaker says, what if I spend an extra 200,000, I put that big scene in, that big explosion scene, then you're gonna get 2 million for the movie, not 1.5. And the distributor says, maybe. We know we're gonna get 1.5. We might get two, but if we don't, you've just eaten up $200,000 worth of profit, of your profit. So do you wanna take that chance? And then the filmmaker says, yeah, because I know what's gonna happen. And the distributor says, well, we've sold 500 movies like this and it's only happened for one. What, are, you know, you're sure you wanna roll the dice on that because it's a very, very risky decision. So I tend to be super pragmatic and I say, it's not worth, it's not worth the business side of it. But let's just talk about budget for a second, right? There's, there's th so many ways to make a budget, all right? Let's talk about three classic ways to make a budget. This is, this is the crazy part about it. Like I keep saying, okay, a million dollars because it's a round number, right? So how do you get to a million dollars? I mean, the classic way that's taught in film school and that most filmmakers use and studios use, this is the classic way. You take the script, you break it down, you schedule it, you break it down into shooting days, all your elements, your locations, you know, your actors, all the kind of stuff. You do a, a, a script breakdown, right? And from that, 
you see what it's going to cost, you budget all the elements, and then you come up with a number. And let's say that number is a million two by somebody doing it the proper way by doing it that way. That's what I call front end budgeting, all right? A million two is the number. Right? Now, there's some wiggle room here or there, you know, you're gonna use this car that blow up or something else or whatever. There's a few things that, you know, come into play, but a million two is your number, right? Then here's another way to do it. You say that realistically your uncle left you a million dollars and that's the only amount of money you're going to have to spend. Nobody else is going to ever give you another dime. You have a million dollars to spend. But you just got a budget for a million too. Does that mean you don't make the movie? Or does it mean that your financial resource is a million dollars, you figure out how to cut out $200,000 and now your budget's a million dollars? So that's what I call back end. You have a million dollars, now you want to just make as good a movie as you can for a million dollars. Do you do it? Like that's the question, right? Then the third way is what I was talking about before, which is the market, the people who do the marketing say the most you could possibly sell this for is, you know, a million three. So don't spend more than a million because we're going to need some 300,000 of wiggle room or something like that um, if you want to be financially successful, which you do. So now you go with the market and they say, you can't spend more than that. That's, that's what you have to make this movie for in order to be successful. Which one do you go with? You're a filmmaker, which one do you go with? The first way at a million two is where are you going to get the money from? Like is somebody going to actually finance it? The second way, somebody said, I got a million dollars, you spend a million, make a good movie, we're good to go. The third way is you're being super fiscal, it's being led by the market conditions. That's a, the, the business decision. Can you make a movie that you know, has artistic merit within that range? So these things all factor in into this, realistically, if you want to get a movie made. Now, there's a lot of filmmakers who say to me, this is my script, this is the breakdown, this is the number. It's a million seven and there's no wiggle room. That's the number. And I say, wonderful. You're probably going to lose money on the movie. You may never get it financed, but hopefully you will and you'll make a great movie and, and, and that's fantastic. But you, you know, you hear the stories of people who spend 10, 15, 20 years of their life chasing that dream. Um, now, on the flip side of that, you know, there's, you're making an action film and it re requires a million dollars to do it properly and people say, no, and I'm going to do it for 100,000. And I say, that's great, do it for practice because I don't care how good a filmmaker you are, the chances of you making a, you know, the production value style of what needs to be a million dollars for $100,000 is extremely low. Yes, people have done it. Yes, I know all the examples, the El Mariachis and, and the Blair Witches, and I know all of them. They're anomalies. They're one out of 50,000 or 100,000. Don't make a business decision based on those you know, people winning the lottery. Like everybody talks about the people who won the lottery. Nobody talks about the hundreds of millions of people who didn't win the lottery. So that's, it depends what business decision you want to make. That was a long answer for <laughs> that question. How many filmmakers accept that? All studio filmmakers accept it because they have to, because they're responsible to, you know, to deliver a bottom line. And a very small sector of indie filmmakers accept that. I mean, they're, they're forced to accept it because if they actually want to make something, there's only a certain amount of money that, you know, they have access to. So I'd say if you want to talk about compromise in the indie film market, most people are making stuff well and for budgets well below what they really should make it for. And then it comes out badly, not because they're not good filmmakers, they're actually really good filmmakers, but they didn't have the resources to make the film properly. So it comes out badly and then that becomes sort of their calling card and they made a bad film and then it's, you know, in some ways almost a negative. It's, you know, it's as crazy as this sound. It's almost better to make those films and not put your name on it. Just do it because you need to practice and hone your skills, but don't put your name on it because it's not necessarily your best foot forward to get money for your next film. I know that sounds nuts, but 
No, no, I've I've heard other like authors say, you know, just accept that your your first book will not probably probably won't be a bestseller, probably won't do anything substantial. And I think it's just like reconciling that with yourself and knowing, okay, I'm probably not going to be this anomaly. I'm not going to, you know, yeah. I know I want to be, but I'm going to accept the fact that I can still do this, but my first one is not going to be this like great success. Yeah. But the beauty of the film business, this is what is so attracting of uh, attractive for the film is it's this this dream, this glamour, this glory. I mean, it's so infectious. You know, people dream of that anomaly. It's, I call it the Hollywood dream, that you can be the anomaly. You can be that one crazy breakthrough hit. Um, and not, not every business has that. This business does offer that. And that's what all indie filmmakers have that dream. And you know, some of them get to live it. Not many, but some do. Sure, and then there's just something satisfying about being in a theater, renting it out, seeing it with an audience, having a Q and A, having an after party. If you're able to afford that, and and being okay with that. Yeah, you know it's funny what you just described: <laughs> being in an audience, renting out a theater, having a party, all that kind of stuff. That's good the first time around. The second time around, the only thing you're the first time around, you're you're in heaven. You're listening to the audience. You're, the, the movie opens and they clap and there's a Q&A and every, it's greatest experience, right? The second time around, all you're thinking about is how much that theater costs you, how much the hors d'oeuvres cost you, how much people are drinking, how much, what the bill at the end of the day is going to be. Even though you enjoyed the movie and you enjoyed that, but after a while it becomes like, can I afford this? So the party's fun the first time and then the the second, third, and beyond, it, it stops being about. The party's always fun because parties are fun, and you're celebrating a work of art that you just created. You're 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 having a baby, like you just brought a new baby into the world, and that's a celebration. So the party's always fun. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy every party, and I have a party for every film because I want to celebrate it. That's the celebration. It's not the business, though. Some people think it's the business. Some people think going to a film festival and sitting through a big screening and everybody doing the Q&A and everything like that. That's a party. And it's a nice party. It's a nice celebration and sometimes it's the only celebration you get. For me, the celebration is getting a really big check from a streaming company because I sold the movie and then seeing it on, the, the first time you see it on a streamer, like on Netflix or something like that, that's a party. That's a real party. I mean, that to me is, for me, sitting in my, you know, family room with my family and watching it the first time it comes onto a streaming company and knowing that I got paid for it, that to me is a celebration. Now, the other stuff is really fun and I enjoy it. And don't get me wrong, I like a good party like everybody else. How does a filmmaker know how much to spend in order to get their money back? Great question. This is where filmmakers, you know, get upset with distributors because they usually get screwed by distributors. That's the truth because distribution is a whole different business mindset they don't have the you know the the sensitivity to filmmakers but distributors do serve a very good function in the in the industry i mean they do know how much a movie is worth where to monetize it where to sell it and they have a pretty good idea of how much they're going to get for it so the best way to find out you know what sort of the range will be will be through a distributor now there are sales agents um, who do these forecasts for you, they give you these ranges. Most indie films, when they're you know, trying to get financed, they'll get a sales agent to do a, a range. And I've seen so many of them. I don't know if you've seen them, but there's the low, the middle, and the high. Sometimes there's five of them, right? They're forecasts based on you know, other like films or comparisons. I mean, you have to be super careful that you're comparing it to like films in the same sort of time frame. Like sometimes they'll compare to like films that were released 10 years ago. Well, I mean, 10 years ago was a completely different market than today, right? So you want the comps to be as you know, accurate as possible, um, but they'll do these comparisons and they'll say, you know, the middle range is sort of what you can expect. And it sort of is what you can expect. I mean, these are people that do this for a living. They know where ultimately they're gonna sell it, what the market will bear, you know, internationally and from each player. Um, and they do forecasts that give you a pretty good idea. Eh, not dead on, but at least a range. And that, that's the best way to gauge it. So similar to how a realtor would run comps, 
on on well this is a fixer and it's this is the square footage and so I think yours will go for this or this one is you know you've just redone the kitchen and bathroom and you've got a huge lot similar correct that's okay. exact same thing I mean I think real estate's a little bit more predictable and accurate because it's confined area you know um, whereas film is the whole world but it's the same concept does that mean if I pick up the phone and just call a distributor they'll give me an idea of what my budget should be um, not necessarily. I mean, we should talk a little bit about distributors and how to find a distributor and, you know, who's reputable and who will give you, you know, the right answer, assuming they'll even answer your phone call. Um, there are, one, you can pay for this. There are services that provide that. They charge a lot and I think they're a bit of a ripoff. I mean, I only think that because I do my own forecast based on my own, you know, market knowledge. Um, but if you don't have any access to anything else, then you can pay for that. Um, and I forget, there's some big companies that actually do that. They provide those forecasts and they do comp reports. I mean, you know, they're fancy and they give you the whole thing. And you take those to investors and say, here, I got this report done from this company who specializes in this. And they're credible. Um, there's sales agents. So there's a difference between a sales agent and a distributor. I mean, that line is sort of crossing over these days a little bit more. Um, but an agent will say, this is what, th they can tell you sort of what to expect um, and they're easier to get to than distributors. Um, a distributor generally wants to look at the movie when it's finished and that's why they're harder to get to. They don't really want to look at the script or the idea or, or be pitched on it. Um, they would be able to tell you and if you can get to them, you know, and we can talk a minute about how to get to them, then you can say, I want to make a, you know, a $800,000 horror film and it's going to have this number of special effects and no talent. Then they can say, expect to get, you know, 800,000 or a million or whatever they, they could, they could say, they could say that in off the cuff over a coffee. They don't need to go and do analysis or anything like that. These people know this in, you know, this is what they do. So how do you get to, how do you find a distributor and how do you get an honest answer? It's getting tougher and tougher to find a, dis a reputable distributor. Um, first of all, that business is getting tougher. So, I mean, this the the world is changing. People's viewing habits are changing. So, so consumption of movies is changing. I mean, a lot of it now is through the streamers, through the subscription video on demand services, the Netflix, the Hulu's, you know, the Disney Pluses. Um, it's easy for consumers. They're spending you know, ten, five to ten dollars a month and getting an incredible array of fantastic product. It's made movie watching such a pleasure. And tele and look at the quality of product they're getting on some of these. I mean, it's incredible the amount, you know, that, that these streamers spend on product because it's a volume game they can afford it, right? So that's making distribution tough, more difficult. So distributors are falling by the wayside also. So they're getting far and fewer between. And they generally want to deal with bigger budget product. They're not crazy about dealing with low budget product for the same reason a real estate agent is not as crazy about, you know, doing a hundred thousand dollar rent sale than a five million dollar sale. Same amount of work, much less commission. So they want to deal with bigger stuff because, you know, they'll make more money off of it. But to find a reputable distributor, I mean, you know, you start, um, there's different ways you can go about it depending on who you are and what your resources are. I mean, you can go to a market like the American film market or something like that, register for it. It's, it's not cheap, but that will give you a, a, access to all the distributors who are registered there, plus access to their guide who's registered in the American Film Marketing Association. You can do the same with, say, you know, Reed Meetham who runs MIPCOM or that type of thing. So th once you get into their database, like when you register as a buyer or seller or whatever, an attendee for a major market like that, the value is half the value is going to the market and you know hobnobbing and seeing what goes on the other half is having access to the database so then now you have this say with the case of mip tv or mipcom um, you know there's 2 to 3000 distributors in that book and in their database so now you got to contact them you got to reach out and it's like any type of networking you you try to be brief explain you know that you're filmmaker making this kind of movie here's what it's going to be you know dress it up a little bit you got to sell yourself a bit and say um, you just want to you're interested in taking it to them after the movie's finished but you want to get an indication of sort of what budget range you should be working in to make sure that 
you're not going to, you know, you have a chance of actually recouping. And they'll, some of them will be cooperative. Like anything else in the world, you know, half of them will be rude. And the other ones, you know, you, you, then you just hopefully get lucky and you get somebody on the phone who's, you know, nice and will give you, or not even on the phone, through an email or whatever the case may be. And if you can't do it that way, you're going to have to pay to get a, a report. And, and with this report, some of the comps, again, special effects, no-name talent. What about, like, locations? How many locations you plan to shoot, things like that? Um, is that, is that factor in? Everything factors in, depending on who you get, because it's all so subjective. But it doesn't really totally factor in. I mean, the main component is talent. If you have a certain level of talent, then it elevates it into a different category. See, like, there are, there's, there's ranges. It's not, you know, like a total linear thing. So in my, I personally think, and again, this is just, everything's just my opinion, right? Okay, but from my experience, if you're dealing in low-budget indie films, stay below about 1.5 maximum. I used to say 2 million, but 1.5 max because the market is getting tougher and tougher and tougher to monetize that. Between 1.5, if once you start getting into that, um, if you don't have major talent, like at least somebody who is recognizable, then you're better off jumping into 5 million. Like between 1.5 and 5 is almost no man's land unless you can figure out how to get talent in there. You have a better chance of getting your money back if you do, a, say, a $5 million movie that has named talent than you do of doing a $3 million movie that's really, really well done but doesn't have named talent. Because talent sells. Talent's a huge fact. Most distributors, the first question they ask is, who's in it? And the reason that's, they ask that is because most consumers ask that. They say, hey, I heard this movie, who's in it? That's 90% of what people ask, so who's in it? And when they, when they recognize somebody, they might take a chance with it. So if you do go to AFM uh, or, or MIPCOM or something like that, then you, you would look at the distributors and make sure you're reaching out to ones that are going to be in your genre. Like don't, if you have a rom-com, don't go to only... Or yeah, and if you have a narrative, don't go to a documentary. You know, some people only specialize in factual, some in you know non-scripted. You know, yeah, there are spe th those are all listed. Also, they are all categorized. People when they list when the distributors list in the in the uh, databases, the, you know, they, they fill out a form and they say this is who we are, this is what we sell, this is what we specialize in. Yeah, so so try to you know hone in on the on the distributor that would be you know more most suitable to what you're making, and keep the email brief. It's funny, I'm talking so much right now, but generally I write super brief emails and I keep my correspondence super brief. And that's because we live in a world of super short attention spans now. I mean, people don't like to read a lot. Everything's sound bites, everything is super quick, everything is, you know, Twitter feeds and, and Instagram posts and stuff like that. It's all super, super short. And with younger executives who, you know, are now used to all this technology, um, they just don't want to read long emails and don't want to hear long pitches and all this kind of stuff. Get to the point quickly. What's the best way to spend money on a movie? Well, if you're talking from a filmmaker's point of view who's making a movie, let's start with that, okay, as opposed to a distributor who's acquiring a movie. Um, so you want to spend the money, like I believe you should put, put most of it on screen. Meaning that, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes in production. Um, I, here's a, the classic example is, is catering. So everybody likes to be, be fed well on set. And I believe in that because, you know, people eat well, they're happy. Um, but you can get really good catering and quality food for a lot less than, you know, there's a big range, right? I don't believe on an indie film that you need to have a chef they're preparing food and serving it and all that kind of stuff, which is what you'd see on a big Hollywood film. Um, you can have a nice, good, hot, quality meal for a fraction of the price, and that does not go on screen. Now, there are filmmakers who argue with me and say, it does sort of go on screen because if they're happy with the meal, they will perform better after lunch. And I say, give them a good, hearty, healthy meal, and you're going to be fine. But don't overspend there because it's not like if you want to spend you know up the ante on your wardrobe on some of your props on some of your special effects people are going to see that put you know five more extras in your scene as opposed to an extra dish on your catering 
So that, I think, as an indie filmmaker, you have to be super prudent about that kind of thing and very, very, very careful. You want to put as much on screen as possible. As a distributor, acquiring a movie, where should you spend your money there? Well, obviously, you're going to try to acquire the movie that you think is going to be the most marketable. And that's based on what's trending in the marketplace and what your customers have been buying. So, you know, you're going to go looking for stuff that you think you can sell. That's all it is. It's no different than a real estate agent. You don't have to fall in love. A distributor does, doesn't have to love the movie they're selling. As a matter of fact, as much as you think this is crazy, nine times out of ten, they don't even watch the movies. They don't need to watch them. They need a trailer. That's it. Um, it's like, you know, the real estate agent does not have to love the house they're selling. They don't have to live in it. They just have to find somebody who does. And that's what a distributor does. They just have to find a customer for it. But a realtor does often do an open house, most yeah, markets. but that's just to give access to potential buyers. Sure. You know, that would be a distributor does a screening to give access to potential buyers. So they, so the real, let's, I'm just surprised that most distributors would not fully watch the movie. Why would you need to? I, I, I guess what if, what if, because you know, sometimes trailers are way better than the film and then there's the opposite. <laughs> I, Generally speaking, a trailer. <laughs> generally speaking, a trailer. The trailer is not better than the film. It should be better. It should tell that story very quickly. I mean, that's the whole point of a trailer. Um, I know it's disappointing for for indie filmmakers to hear that, but it's the truth. I used to go to AFM and as a buyer. This is before I went as a filmmaker. For years, years and years and years. Um, I'm talking like 20 years of AFMs, and I sat in all the theaters and. I would watch, I don't know, within a week, I'd easily see well over 100 movies. I mean, how do you watch 100 movies in a week without? So you'd, you'd go in, you'd watch the first, if in the first 10 minutes you weren't intrigued, you'd go and you go to the next screening. You have to get, you have to be captured in the first 10 minutes. If you are intrigued, you watch the first 20 minutes and then you request a screener. And then depending on how much you're spending on the movie to acquire it, you either don't watch any more of it if it's a very you know inexpensive acquisition or maybe no money at all, no minimum guarantee. If you're going to spend a lot, then you watch the movie. You want to make sure that the whole thing flows. Terrible, terrible yeah. but true. Wow. There's because limited time and and you only you know how many movies can you watch? Distribution confidential. Like <laughs> okay, <laughs> some distributors are going to watch this film and say, hey, that's baloney you know I we watch everything and and you know I'm being honest with you in my distribution company we watched part of everything but there was very few that you'd watch through the end unless you're really really intrigued by it right. but listen how many times have you bought an item a piece of clothing or something like that that you like um, and somebody do else doesn't like it nobody you don't have to love everything that you're selling you just have to know that there's somebody out there who will who, who will like it you sure. just have to get it to them. What are three key points every filmmaker should know about getting a movie made? I would say point number one, and this is, remember, I'm talking about a filmmaker who has the intention to make money, okay, to sell their film. Because if their intention is just to create a movie that is artistic that they want to finish and put on their shelf and enjoy, that's not what I'm talking about. So if we're talking about somebody who has makes a movie with the intention of making a profit on it, selling it, and hopefully making a profit, the first thing they should do, they have to, they have to think about who, who they're going to sell it to, who the audience is, who they're making the movie for. That's number one. Number two is, so number one is identifying the audience. Number two is, how are they going to market to that audience? So now they know what audience they want to get to, but how are they going to get there? How are they going to, what publicity campaign, what social media campaign, whatever, are they going to use to get to that audience? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, you asked me about, you know, about making a movie and I'm talking about selling a movie. I honestly believe that if you want to make money with your movie, as I would say for any business or any product, not just a movie, you got to be thinking about your audience and how to market them before you even make your movie. And then number three would be how to deploy your funds as effectively as possible so that you're getting, as we talked about before, the most of your money on screen. So you're making the best product possible. Don't waste your time and make a crappy product. 
you'll regret it and it won't sell. So make, what you, make something that you're going to be proud of that you feel like you're going to you know, have a shot to sell. But before you do that, make sure you know who you're making it for and that you have, a, an, you have an avenue to get to them. Whether it be through a distributor or through your own means or through your own you know, friends or whatever marketing you're going to do. Now, I tell people this. This is, this is where indie filmmakers really, really struggle with what I'm about to say. And this is what I say to them. I say, when you're budgeting for a movie, make sure that... If you want to be successful, if your movie is going to spend, if you're going to spend five hundred thousand dollars on making your movie, spend at least at least three hundred thousand dollars on marketing it. Like you have to have like sixty, somewhere between sixty and a hundred percent of your production budget. You also have to have for a marketing budget. And they say that's crazy. How are we going to do that? We can hardly raise enough money to make the movie. How are we going to raise money to market the movie? And I say, if you want to have a shot, like if you want to compare yourself to Hollywood movies and studio movies, look at what they do. I mean, everything, every single movie they put out has a gigantic marketing budget. In some cases, it's, you know, the, the production budget and the marketing budget are the same, even on a $50 million movie. Marketing budget might be more, actually. I mean, that's what makes it successful. Because Hollywood movies understand, I mean, studios understand that it's one thing to make a great movie, but it's, it's nothing unless you can get it in front of an audience and you have to advertise it to them. Indie filmmakers don't necessarily do that. So remember, the two things that I led with were know who your audience is and, and make sure you have you know, the wherewithal to get to them, which just usually involves resources. So make sure that when you're budgeting, you tuck a big chunk of money aside for marketing. Now, it's funny, I've listened to a lot of your webcasts here, and a lot of filmmakers talk about it, and they talk about make sure you have enough money. I mean, it's most people say, make sure you have enough money for post production. I mean, I listen to those, and I say, are you kidding me? Like, post production is part of making the movie. Like, you actually went and shot a film and didn't think about post production? Like, that's crazy. Then, then the, to me, it's crazy. Like, I would never do that. I would never go into production without having enough money to finish the movie because what's the point of that? Secondly, some people who are you know, a little further along say, make sure you have enough for delivery because it's expensive to deliver. You have to, you know, there's elements you have to do to, to deliver. I also say, of course you have to deliver. I mean, that's all part of, like, that's part of the production budget. But how many indie filmmakers ever say, make sure you have enough to market? And it's painful to say that. It's actually painful because if you have an extra quarter of a million dollars and you're sitting and you know it's tucked away there for marketing, you're inclined to spend it on the movie. I'll make a way better movie. I'll spend, if I have a quarter of a million dollars more, think of how I can spend it. Think of how good the movie could be. But then you got nothing left to market it with. So no matter how good a movie you made, you, yeah, you can't market it. Now, here's what you'll ask me and here's what everybody says. But that's the distributor's job to market it. It's not my job to market it. It's the distributor. So I'm going to get a distributor and they're going to spend the quarter of a million dollars to market it. That's what they do. And I say, maybe. That means, first of all, you got to get lucky and get a distributor. Secondly, there aren't too many distributors these days who are going to spend a quarter million dollars marketing an indie movie. So you better, like, if you really, really want to get behind your movie, and, and you really believe in it and you want to have a shot at getting it successful, tuck that money aside, raise extra money, put it in a pot and, and tell your investors. They'll actually respect that. They will respect the fact that you're actually thinking about marketing as much as you're thinking about production. Tuck it aside and if you do get a distributor, if you do get lucky and get a good distributor, have them deploy those resources on your behalf so that they have, you know, a, a war chest to help get the movie out. It's only going to be to your benefit. I mean, there are some tricks on how to make that happen so they don't beat you and take fees on your own money and take costs and all that kind of stuff. We'll have to talk about that at some point. Um, so, like, don't just throw it in their laps because they'll, they'll spend it and you won't get any return on it. But if, and, and the other thing is if you don't get a distributor, you may have to self-distribute. And if you're going to self-distribute, you need to have some resources to do that with. It's, it's not good enough to throw out, you know, just a crappy social media campaign these days. It's too crowded out there. Nobody's going to see it. You have to spend some money. Well, what about cream rises to the top? 
So if I get it on one of these streaming services, it's it. it I don't need to. It's gonna. It's gonna. Don't worry. It'll be suggested. Yeah, that's the typical thing. If if I get it on a streaming service, do you know what the odds of getting it on a streaming service are? That would be like if I or, or people say if I get it into Sundance, then you know you know a big company will see it and I will. Let's talk about Sundance. That's okay. That's like the streaming company, all right? It's the same type of deal, right? Getting a movie into an indie movie into Sundance now is almost impossible. I mean, it, it the acceptance rate is so low. It's like getting accepted to UCLA for college students, like 114,000 applications and 3,000 spots. It's extremely, extremely low. All right. So the chances of you getting accepted into Sundance with your indie film are very, very low. But let's say you're one of the lucky ones and you actually do get it in. All right. That's not enough because the next thing you have to do is you have to get a screening time that like it's, it's it's about getting the screening where buyers will actually come. So I'm using Sundance because it's one of the major festivals and we know that there are lots of acquisition executives and you know and movie buyers who could make a difference, who could make your movie, but it, it has to be seen. You have to spend a fortune. You have to hire a publicist. First of all, you have to hopefully get a good screening time. If it's 9 in the morning and there's parties the night before, nobody's coming to your screening. So you have to get an afternoon or I mean that's hard to do, right? You got to get lucky with that. Now you get that, so now you've gotten lucky twice. You have to hire a, a publicity team and a you know and a promotion team. You can't just assume people are gonna come. Somebody's got to be talking it up. That costs a lot of money to hire those people, especially at Sundance, where it's super competitive and where it's hard to get the attention of the buyers because they only want to see the big movies. So that's when I say a lot of money, that could be anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars minimum. Minimum, all right. Not to mention you have to be at Sundance and spend your money to be there and all that kind of stuff. So now you get the buyers there. Likely, your publicity person will say you have to have a party because afterwards you have to entertain them and they have to schmooze with you and blah 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 blah. There's another ten to twenty grand maybe down the toilet. But this is what you're competing with. This is what studios do. So it's not like oh everybody says well, I'll get into Sundance and I'll be set, you know. And then you got to hope that somebody's in a good mood and that they liked your champagne and it was expensive enough that they want to make you an offer. So there's a lot that goes into it. Same with the streaming service. What you think you pick up the phone and call Netflix and say oh I just made a great film. Oh that's great. Send it over. You know, it doesn't work that way. You could wait years and years and years before anybody even sees it. So, or you can get lucky, but you can't. I don't depend on luck. Should a filmmaker think about where they're going to sell their film before they make it? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, there's the there's the plan, and there's the wishful thinking. So the plan is, if all else fails, let's start with the bottom, the lowest common denominator. I mean, we'll start with the top. It's easier, okay? The top would be. Go to a festival, get accepted into a big festival, get your movie seen by a big movie company. They make you an offer, they take it off your hands, give you a big amount of money, and life is really good. Do not depend on that. I'm not saying it can't happen; it likely won't happen. All right, um, and they, you know, they'll sell it to all the right players, and you're done. All right. So let's say that doesn't happen. I hope it does happen for all you indie filmmakers. But if it doesn't, which it likely won't, plan number two. Get it into a lower level festival. Now, that's more of a celebration because buyers don't really attend those festivals. But you can get some audience feedback and get some buzz, maybe some critical, you know, maybe some, you know, awards, something like that, that that'll help you to get the attention. Then you got to get it into the distribution cycle. So the distribution cycle is either finding a distributor or sales agent. Um, do you want me to explain the difference between a sales agent and a distributor? Sure. Okay. So a sales agent, I mean, again, they're they're melding into sort of one and the same these days. But a sales agent generally finds you a distributor. A distributor generally finds um, places your 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 film in the homes of where people are going to view it, like i.e. the streaming services, the broadcasters, whatever. A distributor is we call them distributor because they get the movie out. They distribute the movie out to. The places where it will get consumed, which is primarily television, now streaming and video on demand. All right, and you know air, airlines and all that kind of stuff. Whereas a sales agent doesn't deal necessarily with broadcasters and streamers; they deal with distributors. So sometimes it's hard to get to distributors because, especially before the fact, before you make your movie, they want to deal only with finished films. 
and they don't have a lot of time and they want to deal with bigger budget films so it's 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 often very very tricky to navigate that and they're they're a bit of a pain in the butt to be honest with you um, and they're not responsive and they're um, and some of them aren't even credible so it's, it's usually easier to get through a sales agent who can represent you into di a distributor and the problem with that is you're going to pay two levels of commissions you're going to pay the sales agent their commission which is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent generally and then a distributor is going to take somewhere between 20 and 30 percent now some will ask for 35 or 40 but uh, you know in a second I'm going to talk about what not to <laughs> accept in a distribution deal so so you, you're adding an extra level of distribution and an extra you know level of, of transmission of funds and everything starts to get diluted but if you don't have any other way to get there then you know that you have to do that but let's say that fails too let's say you can't get a distributor let's say you can't get a sales agent to get you a distributor for whatever reason nobody's available you've asked everybody and they're just not responsive that leaves you to self-distribute now I personally believe in self-distribution because I have a lot of distribution experience and I am a bit of a control freak I like to do it my way and you know I respect the fact that people are doing jobs but if I don't like to pay commissions for when people don't do their job properly so self-distribution is tricky it's hard to navigate but it's not any trickier than making a movie I mean you just finished making a movie and you spent your life doing that and your resources and you navigated all that so you just got to get creative you got to switch gears and you have to say okay now I'm going to get creative in marketing and I'm going to try to get it out to an audience the problem is is that most creative artistic people feel that that's a business function and they don't do that that's one is they don't like to do it two is they don't know how to do it three is they don't want to do it so that means you're kind of stuck where do you go what do you do I mean you, you, you don't have a home for your movie and then you get aggravated and frustrated which is you know a lot of indie stories you hear about that right so you wait and you wait and wait and hope that I mean you hope that something happens but it usually doesn't so you kind of, the good news about the digital era right now is that it's not that hard to self-distribute I'm not saying it's going to be that successful but like for instance putting your movie up on Amazon and I'm not talking Amazon Prime the streaming side of it I'm talking about Prime Video you know the transactional side is real easy I mean you send it in you fill it in a submission thing they review it um, it's not that hard to do you, you know I have to make delivery you have to make sure you can deliver the elements they need and, and the trailer and, and the artwork and that kind of stuff but you just made a movie you should be able to do that you should be capable of doing that I know you're not going to like it I know an indie filmmaker is not going to love doing it um, so and if you don't then find somebody who does find a friend find a marketing person find somebody who will take that on and, and help out and would you need E&O insurance before you do that or is that a requirement of being on some of those platforms yeah E&O you know, is primarily I mean you have to have E&O if you're on any television and, and any streamer because they they want to be you know they, they want to be covered with that liability so you know is errors and omissions by the way for people who don't know and that is if you did something that you weren't supposed to do like you showed a you depicted a character a name a person or some building or something like that you weren't licensed to do that you could get sued and the television station doesn't want to carry that liability of being sued for that so that's what that insurance covers um, generally speaking the the transactional video on demand or don't ask for you know that's not one of the criteria but you know it's a really good question to be honest with you I mean I've never not had you know everything I just automatically get you know because they sell to streaming companies um, but I'm going to need to look into that whether or not you need you know for transactional video on demand I don't know with you know insurance are there different levels different packages yeah yeah um, it goes by it's like any type of insurance it goes by how much coverage you want so um, you know usually the minimum it used to be a million dollars these days and it's now I believe it up to about three million for major broadcasters so they want their liability level to be at three million per incident and then 10 million cumulatively if there were multiple incidents and those are standard packages um, that's for indie films um, that's the coverage right that's not the policy the policy can go anywhere depending on it's negotiable right this is like buying any insurance it's like buying health insurance or home insurance or anything like that you know it's a range 
but within the range, there's a couple of bells and whistles. Like, what's your deductible, deductible going to be? I mean, there's a deductible, right? So it's no different than buying any other insurance. But generally speaking, a broadcaster will want it at a certain range, which is about $3 million minimum. Um, unless it's a big, big, big show and might be $5 million, something like that. And how long would one need the policy to be in effect? Great question. So um, generally, if there's going to be an error or an omission or something like that, it will be seen within the first two years. It will generally be seen within the first two years of it going on to some type of broadcasting thing. So generally, these policies are two to three years. Um, some people take them for five, sometimes even 10 years, just because they're selling over and over to different people and, and other people request it. But also in the case of an indie film, you're generally going to get like one selling cycle. Like it's going to go out there, it's going to get sold, and you don't really have to buy coverage for what will be down the line. If you're lucky enough and there's like it comes, say, say you sell to Netflix and it's a three year, four year deal, right? And it comes off in Netflix, don't buy another four years up front until Netflix renews. If Netflix renews and they say, hey, you need more e &O, then go and buy the e &O for the for the second period. There's no point in spending the money now, even though it's cheaper, obviously, to buy it longer term, but you may not need it for a second term. I believe you have three movies currently on Netflix. Did you pitch all of those movies yourself to Netflix? Okay, so the three movies, so first of all, Full Out is the first movie. It's a gymnastics movie. The second one's called Kiss and Cry. It's a skating movie. And the first one, the third one is called Full Out 2, You Got This, which is actually starting on January 1st. So it's already sold and delivered to Netflix, but they're actually starting airing it on January 1st. It, it's a, another gymnastics movie. They were supposed to start it during the Olympics last summer, but of course there were no Olympics. So they held it till January. So, but they're all, I, I say it's on because it's delivered. And that's when it's going to start worldwide. So did I? So I pitched. Um, luckily, back then when I pitched the first one, they were open to hear pitches from independent producers. Um, I got lucky because the timing. They were a big company, but they weren't what they are today. So they they were still taking pitches from indie producers. So I went in there and I pitched them myself, and you know I learned a lot. It's 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 a whole different style. They get so many pitches. I didn't know this back then. You got to keep those pitches really short, get to the point really sweet because they get so many of them that they get tired of hearing them. So they just want to make a quick decision and hear what you got to say. So I pitched it I pitched it too long. I had like a half an hour meeting and I probably took 20 minutes to pitch that other than, you know, 10 minutes of pleasantries. Today, I pitch in 2 minutes, 2 to 3 minutes max. That's all it that's all it takes because they 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 generally know, all right? So I pitched it and they said, okay, sounds good. We like it. Let's do it. But we don't want to take delivery from you because you're an indie producer. We want to take delivery from a distribution company that we're already set up to do business with because we don't want to set you up as a new client in our database. It's too much work for us. So I said, but I'm also a distributor. I have my own distribution company and um, I, I make delivery. I'm like, I, I make perfect delivery to the distributors or to, I, I'm making delivery to broadcasters around the world, so delivery is not an issue. And they said, yeah, but we're so busy, we have so much going on, we would prefer that we put you through a distributor. And I said, I don't have a problem with that, except for they're going to charge me a full fee for doing nothing. I mean, I pitched you, I did the sale, you want the movie, I'm going to have to pay their full commission. And they said, Jeff, you seem like a sharp guy, figure it out. Go negotiate it, figure it out. So they gave me a list of, of like six or seven distributors that they recommended who I could do business with. I met with two of them. I chose one of them and I cut a good deal, but not a fantastic deal because I had no leverage. They knew that I was sent there. So I had to deliver through another distributor. And I was kind of a little peeved by it, but you know what? It was Netflix. That's what they wanted. And what am I going to argue? I mean, you know, so that I had I had to do that deal, and it worked out well. They, they, the other people, they did the deal. Then they actually happened to be a good distributor. They did some other deals too, and it worked out pretty well. So I can't complain about it. So the second time around, same thing. Go to Netflix, pitch them on the movie, love it. Let's do it. I said, guys, please don't make me go through a distributor. They said, Jeff, you know the rules. Got to go through a distributor. I said. How many times do we have to go down this? Anyways, 
same thing happens. I go, I, go, I use a different distributor this time because now it's different times. I, I actually make, you know, a different type of deal and it works out. Third time around, let's do it. Please let me just deliver to you. Please let me deliver to you. If I fail, I said, listen, if I fail, don't even pay me the licensing fee. If I don't deliver on time per exactly per your specs, which I'm doing anyways to these other distributors, I said, I'm already, they're doing nothing. They're just pushing a button to send the materials that I've given them. I, I have your delivery list and your specs. I make the, I do all the delivery items. Please just give me a chance. The third time they did. So now it's direct. And if there's Netflix people watching, thank you very much. I really appreciate that you let me have that chance. And I made delivery. I made delivery two months ahead of their delivery schedule. And everything's fine. And they already confirmed delivery and it's perfect delivery. And you know, their delivery schedule is five pages long. I mean, and by the way, I have to deliver those movies in 18 languages and, and six subtitles. 20, there's 25 versions of them. And uh, I mean, delivery alone is a lot more money than a lot of indie filmmakers spend on making their movies, just making delivery. All the soundtracks, all the m and tracks, everything. I mean, it's, it's a very, very extensive process making delivery. But there's, you know, companies you use who are certified, you know, um, um, I forget what they call them, not aggregators, uh, whatever. They're, they deliver, they're, they specialize in, in delivering to Netflix and you hire them and they do your, your dubs and your this and your that and you just have to manage it all. And then, you know, some stuff, you do your own stuff, your own artwork and things like that. So you, you have, making delivery is, is a big part of the business and you have to do it properly. But I really appreciate that Netflix gave me the chance to do it. And I did it properly, and uh, and hopefully that, you know, I mean, I again, that's part of distribution. How did you get the appointment to to pitch to even know that your pitch was too long originally and you shortened it down? Because at heart, I'm a sales guy. I mean, you know, I remember I went from law school into the sales department of a distribution company. That's what you do. You you get appointments and you meet with people and you pitch them, and you have to be super, super tenacious and, and very persistent and polite. And the most important thing is you have to, here's, here's the motto I tell everybody who works for me. You, you can quote me on this. No means not today. Everybody starts with a no. Everybody starts with a no. And if you take no as the definitive answer, you cannot survive in this business. I say no means not today. It means I'm not going to give you the appointment today. I'm not going to give you the deal. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to even talk to you. I'm not going to return your email. I don't take that as personal rejection. That's part of the business. It's a pain in the butt, but it's part of the business. And I just keep at it over and over and over in a very nice way. I assume that that's part of the business. And I have 22 years of experience getting no's. There are lots and lots of no's. Lots of doors shut on your face. Lots of no return phone calls. Thousands tens of thousands of them. But you know, ultimately, if you believe in your product and you know that you have something to offer to them, you know, sooner or later, they'll maybe, you know, give you a shot. It, I used to say, you know, it takes a hundred calls to get an appointment. I don't say that anymore. Now I say it takes 250 calls to get an appointment. The number's gone up. So if you know that going into it, and you know, for all the people who were, have worked with me in my office, they know that that's true. They might say, no, Jeff, you're wrong. It's now 300, you know, and, but we, you know that that's part of the process and, and you just deal with it and you live with it. And it's, 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 is it a little depressing and, and aggravating? Yeah, of course it is. You know, and are people totally rude and, you know, not returning any emails or calls? Right? It's part of the process. And when you went in the third time to pitch, what are you bringing with you? Just a log line synopsis? Okay, I'm an anomaly. Don't independent producers who are watching this do not assume this is this is this is the Blair Witch Project. This is this is not what normally goes on. Okay, I had a track record from two other films. If I didn't have that, I wasn't even going to get. Every single time you do it, it's a new adventure. Yeah, so they know that I can make the movie on time and on budget and a quality movie. That helps open the door and get the appointment to start with, all right? Secondly, um, everything got delivered on time. And thirdly, 
they did well with the movies. Had they not done well, I wasn't going to get another appointment. It's business. It's all statistics. They look at their little iPad in front of you and they say, okay, your numbers are dead. They don't tell you the numbers because that's, you know, confidential. Um, but if your numbers aren't good, you're, one, you're not getting an appointment, and two, you're not getting a deal. So, so how do you, here's the big question. So how does a new filmmaker even get the first appointment? How do you get the first time in there? Here's how I think you get it in. You got to go in with somebody else. You got to go in with an established producer who has a track record, who you can make believe in you or who does believe in you and can hold your hand through the process and give you that credibility and that experience because not only what the streamers want and the broadcasters, but your investors, the investors want, they want to know that you're going to be able to deliver what you say you can deliver. And if you haven't done it before, it doesn't mean you can't do it. You probably can do it. It just means they don't know for sure that you're going to be. And so they want to bet on somebody who's done it before. So for, say, a streamer to, you know, say, okay, you know, Jeff will make sure your product's going to get delivered on time and on budget, quality, or, or an investor. Um, I guess I have a track record that helps. It really helps to have a track record. And that's sort of what all the agencies have and all, you know, these are the people want to do business with people that they've already done business before because it's more predictable. So getting in the first one or two times is way more difficult because you don't have a track record. So I think the best way to do that is to hook up with somebody who does. Unless you can get super lucky and, you know, get your own appointment. And where would one meet a person of this caliber? Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, generally, you're going to go on the internet and you're going to watch all these webcasts and interviews and all this kind of stuff and all these people who are claimed to be, you know, teachers and, and master classes and this and that and, and pros. And it's tricky. It's tricky. I mean, but you kind of opened it up for me to do a pitch for myself here. I mean, I do consulting for those people to find other people. So I don't necessarily do that for people. Um, I have done it. I've done a couple of projects where I've, I've mentored them. Once in a while, I'll do that. But usually what I do is, uh, as a consultant, I hire myself as a consultant to hook those people up with other like people, either certain genres. Because, by the way, like when you're dealing with Netflix now, there are, I don't know, there's got to be a thousand, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 buyers. I mean, there's so many departments now with so many little niches. So if you fit into this category, like if you're horror, psychological thriller, blah, 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 there's like maybe five different categories and you need to go into the right one. So you got to be hooked up with somebody who kind of knows how to navigate that one. It's a little tricky these days. Okay, here's, here's another question. So I'm at an event, let's say, and it's, it's maybe film oriented and maybe it's AFM, whatever. How am I approaching someone? I see them from across the room. I realize, you know what, this person could get me in that door. Yeah. How am I approaching them where I'm not disingenuous, how I'm not this sleazy L.A. sort of opportunist, or maybe all the rules go out the window? Great, great question, and, and, and it really boils down to how do you do it in a bar? I mean, you know, like it just depends on who you are, what mood you're in, how many drinks you've had, you know, it really does. It's <laughs> it's a chemistry thing. Uh -huh, you know, okay. so yeah. you know, it it's true. Like sometimes you just feel a little more daring. Sure. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be that sleazy LA type of thing. Nobody wants that. But uh, you know, sometimes people respect, and you know, it, it could be like I don't know how to do. I I was never great in a bar. Ironically, I'm pretty good in a sales room, but like I'm not that good in a bar. Um, I just don't feel comfortable in that environment. I hear you. And it's the same, standing in the lobby at the AFM, in the Lowe's Hotel there. It's it's tricky. It's really tricky. And they're usually talking to people and they always look so busy. You don't want to interrupt. Um, so that's got nothing to do with filmmaking and everything to do with interpersonal skills and, and confidence and and humility and whatever. It's It's chemistry. Yeah, I think that's a fair answer. I, you're right, and, and there are people that are masters at it. I see them at Starbucks, I see them wherever, and they're just, they just have that it factor where they can start conversations, yeah. and it's not over the top, I need something from you. Right. And then there's other people, 
and I and I can't even say that they're trying to be sleazy or disingenuous. It's just it's just an approach. Yeah. And I think some people just are, you're right. I, I don't really feel comfortable in bars either, so I get it's a, it's it's a it's a chemistry thing. Yeah. So I don't. That's the word I use. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. And I don't know if t chemistry. I guess it can be manipulated. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, those... and it's also you know it's funny they all these markets ha and festivals have these big parties, right? The problem with the parties is they're so loud you can't really talk to anybody, you can't right. engage. But maybe that's better, you know. You can, I don't know. It's 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 a social dynamic that it's it's tricky. You know, I generally approach it as real business. Like that's who I am, just a real straight up business guy, which isn't. Sometimes that doesn't work. A lot of people want it to be more social. And I, you know. Yeah. But then sometimes the ones that are really good at that, it's it's like a flakiness. So there's a really fine line yeah. to it. I, yeah, I don't think you can And really it depends talk. on the, the other person, right? How they receive that. Some people like to be, you know, have that flaky thing. Some people don't. But you don't know because you're right. under the person. So you have no idea. Right. It's like blind dating. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. Good point. Have you only pitched Netflix three times and you were successful at all pitches or there were more times? There were more times. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there were many more times when they, they were not as receptive, which is fair game, right? You can't like everything. But it taught you something. I know it's a cliche, but you learned shorten the pitch maybe, no, what they like. No, it's, no? They, they didn't like it. They didn't like what I had to offer. So fair is fair. You, you know, you can't expect everybody to like everything. Okay. I mean, I, you know, I respectfully disagree. I think the other stuff I pitched was in some ways even better, but... Didn't happen that time. But my motto is no means not today. So those are on the back burner. There will be another cycle. I will pitch them again. I have to wait for new people to come in sometimes or, you know, people to change departments or whatever. And then, you know, you, you do it again. Are you bringing in art, like key art as well or no? That doesn't factor in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you are? I mean, okay. yeah, especially at a streaming company. Um, yeah. At a distributor, you don't have to because the distributor wants to make the key art. So they, they actually don't want you. They, they want to do it. Okay, unless you've had it done professionally really good and you're a good artist, whatever. Um, I always bring in key art. One little, you know, it's, to give, it's, it, it gives a visual image. And I, and I bring in a trailer and key art and a log line. That's it. That's all you need. It's pretty short and sweet. And so then how does it go? Okay, great. They tell you right there, no, we can't do this. They say, we'll let you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a we'll let you know. It's a, it's a, but you can, <laughs> after you leave those meetings, you analyze the we'll let you know for a long time. Was it a good we'll let you know? Was it a medium one? Was it a bad one? Like, you know. <laughs> was there an inflection? At the end? Was there yeah. an inflection? <laughs> Wasn't there they an inflection? Raise an eyebrow, yeah. <laughs> was there an inflection on the let? Was there on the no? <laughs> <laughs> right, you right. drive yourself crazy. Sure, sure. And then you just hope that on your follow up, you know, you get a good result. And then do you do you so what's your time frame for following up? I usually ask them when I should follow up. You know, I actually I used to ask. Now I say I'll, I'll follow up with you in a week. Is that okay? Um, so because you don't want to appear that you're bugging them or pestering them or whatever, and so you do, and you got to be good at follow up. And then, uh, you know, hopefully you get a response. If you don't, you politely follow up, you know, a couple days later. Everything's got to be polite and professional, even though they're not necessarily, I'm not saying Netflix. I'm, Netflix Netflix is actually the most professional sure, company sure. I've ever dealt Absolutely. with. Absolutely. And, and I'm not saying that for the video. It's true. Yeah. They, they, their follow-up is unbelievable. They return their calls. For me, anyways, I've been lucky that my buyer has been super, super responsive and polite and professional. Whereas some people, you'll never hear anything from them, distributors primarily. You wonder if your email's even working. You didn't get a bounce back, but like <laughs> you often wonder, you know? So you follow up politely, you be as professional as possible. And you know, just sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. How much money can I expect to get if I sell my film with Netflix? I mean, great question. Um, I think it's very individual based on you know, your film, what the buyer wants to pay. So everybody wants a range. And by the way, most indie producers usually lie about this in cocktail parties. They throw, numbers get thrown around. It's it's often not the case. But the, the truth is this, okay? First of all, I don't feel comfortable necessarily talking about that in the interview. But secondly, 
um, in, in my Netflix contracts, it says that I'm not supposed to talk about it because they don't want other indie producers saying, hey, you gave him that much. They don't want to have to compete back and forth or whatever. So I'm going to be respectful of that. It's, it's an actual clause in the contract. Okay, that's fair. Absolutely. Isn't it damaging for a filmmaker to think of their movie as a product? I guess as an artist, you might want to, you might think that that's a little insulting or belittling maybe as an artist, but it depends what you consider a product to be. I mean, if we look up the definition of a product, it's, you know, something that gets consumed, I think, you know, or something like that. I don't know if I haven't looked it up, but it, I assume it would be like something like that. Um, so you want your movie to be watched. That's consumption by viewers. So in that case, it is a product. I mean, you know, it's an entertainment product, but that's semantics. So we don't have to call it a product. We can call it a movie. When do you think we started thinking about movies as products? Or has it always been that way going back to Kubrick and, and even farther back? Remember, I didn't go to film school. <laughs> so in, 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 you know, in, in a commerce program and a law program, everything is a product or a service. I mean, that's the terminology you're using, right? So that's just the terminology that I'm used to using. Um, but I'm sure they don't use that terminology in film school. They call it, you know, film or movies or something like that. I don't think they call them products. So it's just, re it is semantics. It's, it's the same item. It's just what you're calling it. I don't, I don't mean to belittle a film by calling it a product. Like, it seems to me like you're almost suggesting that I am belittling it by using the term product. I, you know, there's lots of things. Everything's a product or a service. So I, it's, I'm not degrading the film by calling it a product. Okay. So I guess because for me, I think of a product as a widget. And, and I think of it as serving some type of a, a function in the home or, or in the car or whatever. But then a film or a book or uh, music, to me, I guess it is a product. I just don't, I don't see it in that way. And I'm just wondering if, if other people... Will will either agree or disagree, and okay. So in in classic business school, there's products and services. So a product would be a widget, like you described, and a service would be you know like legal services or okay. What would a film be? Does it fall into either category, or is it? It's got its own category. I guess it would fall into a category, but but for me, I guess it's just something that I. I take in and I'm not really expecting a certain result from, but maybe that's too ethereal, I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, perhaps there is another category. I mean, you know, perhaps I missed that in, you know, one of my marketing classes or something like that. Maybe there's a third category that it, you know, is a consumable or something. I don't sure. know, something like that. But uh, I, I, I really don't feel that it's a derogatory term to call a film a, a product. And by the way, when, when, they, when they were being sold in DVDs, like when you bought a DVD, is that, a, is that, that is also true. not a product? Or, no, you're correct. Like what about a hardcover book? I mean, now everything's digital, right? So you're not receiving anything. But, uh, right. but would right. a book is something you tactile, touch yeah. and mm -hmm. you put on a shelf? And Very good point. Yeah, I guess it's just training my mind to think that way. And, and maybe that's the difference between an artist that's successful and one that's not is just knowing that even though this is your sort of blood, sweat, and tears, and you may or may not be writing for a, a so-called market, that it is a product. And yeah. maybe that's what separates people. It, it's just, it's terminology. Like in a distribution company or even in, say, a streaming company, what would, or a studio, um, the collection of movies that they have, do you know what term they use for that? No. It, inventory. Okay, okay. Now, inventory is a product term. Got it. It's, it's that's how much stuff we have in our warehouse on how many widgets we have in our warehouse on our shelves. Sure. That's inventory. So having film rights, that's your inventory or your catalog. That would be your catalog. Um, but that's inventory, basically. Okay, that makes sense. So the Amazon warehouse is going to have X number of boxes of oatmeal and I'm going to place an order for one. Well, okay, let me, let me rephrase that. Okay. DVDs sitting on a shelf would be inventory because those are, those are physical tactile objects, right? The rights to the films would be a catalog or a library. So it wouldn't, there's, it's not necessarily inventory. It's, it's a catalog or library because it's rights. But now when you're delivering those rights, 
it's interesting. You know, maybe there should be new terminology because when you're delivering them not phys- like digitally, where there is no physical tactile medium that you're actually touching, maybe there should be another word. Maybe it's not product. But I don't know the other words, so probably somebody's, maybe one of your viewers will phone in and say, hey, you should use that word. And let me know, please. Okay. I know you've said previously that you, you love movies and you've talked about how you know, stories are very dear to your heart, but that you went into this business to make money. Is there anything wrong with that? Why does that get a negative connotation, negative, negative uh, spin? It doesn't have a negative spin to me. I mean, why does anybody go into business? I mean, you know, it depends on the business you go into. Like, luckily, I went into a business that I really enjoy and that I, and there's an artistic element and a creative element, which makes the business more fun and more exciting. But um, I do want to live a nice, comfortable life and I want my family to be comfortable. So making money is an important component of that. I mean, it's kind of finding a balance in your life. Um, But let me readily admit this to you, okay, if you want something evil, you know, if I didn't think there was an opportunity to make money in the film business, then I wouldn't have gone into it, okay? As much as I would have, I would have made films, but I would have been a hobby filmmaker as opposed to a career filmmaker, and I would have, you know, maybe been a practicing lawyer and hopefully made, you know, a nice living, which would afford me the opportunity to hire people to make that movie for me. So I could have done it that way. But I did see that there was an opportunity early on to do to make a living at the film industry. So I stayed with it because um, because I was able to do that. Now, if I would advise people that if they want to have a nice, balanced, comfortable life, if they don't feel that they can make a living at it, then it doesn't mean you can't make movies. It just means maybe don't make a living at that. Do something else that you can make a living at. And, um, you know, same thing I would say to actors. Um, If you're not making a living at being an actor, it doesn't mean you have to quit acting. It means go get a job that you can support yourself and have a balanced life, but still stick to the acting and hopefully you get a lucky gig here or there. And I know they say to me, well, you have to be full time and committed to it in order to you know, take it seriously. And I say, yeah, but you know, that's about finding a balance, whatever balance works for you in your life. So just find that and be comfortable with it. But you know, I would put my family above filmmaking. So the comfort of my family would, if I had to sacrifice and never make another movie because I wanted my family to be comfortable would be a no-brainer in a second that that would be the decision and that's the balance that I have in my life sure and that's a fair response what if someone says well I'm a filmmaker but I'm not good at contract law I'm not good at details like that I'm more of a visual person I'm, I'm not analytical it's funny when you say what if you just described every filmmaker <laughs> that's not a what if that's every single filmmaker Every filmmaker is looked Jeff. I get you. I get the fact that you think we have to know business aspects and all this kind of stuff, but that's not what we signed up for. It's not who we are. I'm creative. I, I, I need to express my artistic self. I, 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 I don't even enjoy the other stuff. It's a necessary evil of the business. What you do is evil. What I do is artistic and fun. And I say, okay, fair enough. But if guys like me don't do what we do, then Guys like you don't do what you do. Here's the analogy I use. Drive into Universal Studios through the Lancashire Boulevard entrance. Okay, not through the other side, the Lancashire Boulevard stuff. When you drive in there, you need to pass by that big 38-story black building there on the right, or whatever, that, you know, that big NBC Universal building. Okay, everybody drives right past it. And they, they can't wait to get into the studio and go to the back lot and see the tour and all the fun stuff. Oh, here's the sound stages. Here's where the movies have been made. Here's the, this, that, all the fun stuff. Do you know what goes on in that building? That's all the finance, distribution, all the sales and marketing to enable the rest of the stuff that goes on on that tour to happen. You take down the functions of that building and you don't have a studio anymore. So yeah, is it boring? Is it finance and numbers and sales and all the stuff that's not artistic yeah it's but that's what that's the heartbeat of the operation that's what makes it tick because last time i checked they call the film business the film business they don't call it the film art the film they call it the film business so the word film and the word business are equal yeah the word film came first but you could call it the business of film if you want those are equal components they need each other 
You need good artistic entertainment in order to drive a business, but you need a business in order to facilitate the artistic endeavor. That's a marriage. They're both important. So do people like what I do? No, no film. Listen, let me make this very clear. I wanna make this super clear. If I never had to look in another contract, negotiate another deal, look at another spreadsheet, make another phone call ever in my life, I wouldn't miss it for a second. If I could do nothing but write and direct for the rest of my life, I would be the happiest guy you ever met, happier than any of these other filmmakers. I would love that. What a luxury that would be. I wouldn't miss any of that other stuff. You think I enjoy it? It is a necessary evil, okay? but. It just, it's part of it. It's like saying, have a body, you know, you can have a heart but not a brain. You can't, the two work hand in hand. You have to have both. Can you share about the Netflix deal that you got? What are some of the components of it? I'll explain how Netflix deals work. So there's generally two types of Netflix deals. There, there's hybrids in between, but the two major categories are what they call Netflix branded or Netflix originals. So when you watch Netflix and, and it says a Netflix original, it means that they created that product. Okay, product I shouldn't use. They created that movie or that TV series. All right, it was an in-house production, which they funded and they own. And it's, it's a, that's why they call it a Netflix original. All right, they didn't necessarily make it. They might have hired a third party production company. They don't have necessarily an in-house production company. So they, they finance it and they own it, but they, could have hired other people to actually make it for them. That's often the case. And so we call those service producers. Those are people who take on a contract to make something for Netflix and all the other streaming services. So that's one side, all right? The other side is an independent production company or studio will make something, finish it, complete it, and then, then Netflix will acquire it finished. And that's the non-branded side. All right, so those aren't Netflix originals because they didn't make them. So, on my, when my, so that's what I do. I make my movies and then they acquire them. The hybrid would be, sometimes Netflix will say, hey, do you want to make a movie? If, 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 if you make this movie, we will acquire it. So they might say to you beforehand, and it's very rare they say that, by the way. It used to be, used to be more common. It's rarer now. Um, where they would say, it's not a pre-sale per se, okay? Because a pre-sale means that they're generally they're gonna pay for it up front. So they'll, say, they'll give you a pre-commitment and say, if you make this and, it, you know, and it's within our standards and everything that you do and we trust you're gonna make it properly, then we will acquire it from you for this amount of money. So that's the hybrid situation. And so, I mean, listen, most people who are gonna do work for Netflix are gonna work on the branded side. And that's where most of the activity comes because most of what they do now is, is their own stuff. You know, they become a huge studio, right? So they hire lots and lots of outside production people and you know, like all young people who are graduating from film school, hopefully they can work on that side because there's lots of jobs there. There's tons of activity, tons of production going on, um, but they own it all. And on my side, which is fewer and fewer and fewer acquisitions. Um, you know, we are independent producers, we own it. Um, it's harder to do this because you got to self-finance it. There's cash flow issues. There's, you know, lots and lots of logistics that you have to go through. Here it's easy. Hey guys, you're gonna make this movie for us. Don't worry about any of the financing or marketing. We got it all covered. Just make us a really, really good movie or TV show, which is the dream, what we were talking about before. So I've considered that side too, but that, you gotta get on a list there. I mean, that's, that's what we call curated. I mean, it's not like, hey, you show up and you say, hey guys, I'm available, what show are you gonna put me on? <laughs> no, no, it's like, it's not extra whoa, work. whoa, whoa, yeah. we have a list of five, 10,000 filmmakers and we have one film that needs to get made. Who are we gonna choose, you know? <laughs> What's the best way for a filmmaker to generate revenue for themselves? Indie, it's, the indie business is a tough, tough business. Don't get me wrong. It is a super, super tough business and, and it's not getting any easier. So for an independent filmmaker, I mean, listen, probably the safest way to do it is to actually work for somebody else, you know, to work on like, you know, if you could get hired on a, like on a Netflix production or something like that um, and make a living, that, that's a good way to do it. But you're not making your own stuff. You're not choosing what you're going to make. 
So if you want to go down that indie route where you're going to choose it and 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 direct it and decide, you know, how everything you want to be in the driver's seat. It's tough to make money. It's a tough tough business. Uh, and and I feel it's it's a lot tougher now than when I started in it. And everybody says, "Yeah, but there's so much more being consumed and so many more outlets and so many more streaming companies and and now it's the world is the whole marketplace because it's digital." And that's true. Well, that's true. The problem is nobody wants to pay for anything. Everybody's so used to consuming everything for free. I mean, look at all the apps on your phone. How many apps do you pay for? I mean, think of the apps that you have, like the like Waze or or Google. I mean, you know, Google's going through a suit now, but I mean, I mean, think of the the power of the computer that you have in the palm of your hand for nothing, for free. Yeah, you're paying for your cell signal, but I mean, so it's the same with movies and music. Music's even worse. I mean, everybody, and especially the younger generation, they're so used to not paying for anything. Nobody wants to pay for anything. Like I never, it never occurred to me when I used to go to the movies and pay, you know, fifteen dollars for for my ticket and and twelve dollars for popcorn and a drink. That was a nice night out, and I enjoyed it. I mean, you talk to young people about that. Are you crazy? Why would I do that when I can download it for free on my phone? You know, so the problem with the industry and with a lot of artistic industries right now is that, uh, and a lot of you know technology-based industries. I mean, you know, computer software being probably the leading one, is that it gets pirated so much, and that really nobody wants to pay for anything. So it's really, really hard to monetize stuff now. You put it out there, and hopefully people will respond to it and love it. But even then, they don't want to pay for it. Yeah, and one of the things that was so enjoyable about going to the movies in the past was that people didn't have a phone. It's very distracting to be around it. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's another discussion. I know, I that's the distraction that's not, discussion. But, but the 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 monetizing discussion. Is, sure. You know, even nobody ever blinked an eye going into a blockbuster store and renting a title or buying a DVD. Nobody blinked. Today, it's unheard of. To like, you know, and I say to my kids, you know, it's going to cost us four ninety nine to stream this movie tonight. I say, are you kidding me? I'll just download it for free. I mean, my sons know. My sons, every kid, every kid knows how to navigate the internet so well. You can get anything, sure. anything you want. Do you think it hurts that there's too much choice? I know that sounds like a really weird. No, no I, I call it. I don't. I call it dilution. There's too much dilution. I mean, it's just there's so much available now. Um, I mean, just look at YouTube. The amount of content available on YouTube. It's 500 lifetimes worth of content, if if not more, and get and growing every day by you know an extra 10 lifetimes every single day. Um, it's just it's so we're bombarded by so much. Here's as one of my friends said it to me. He said the good news about you know the worldwide you know digital economy and the and the internet is that you have access to the whole world. The bad news is you can't get anybody's attention anymore. Because it's so diluted, there's so much out there. So I do think it's great to have choice, obviously. But look at—I mean, I—I I don't, you know, I don't want to give my age away. But I grew up. We had, I think, we had eight or ten channels on our TV. Well, I have six hundred channels now. I mean, I don't even get past the first hundred. You know, I used to have my favorites like everybody else. But like, I mean, how could you ever consume even a fraction? I don't even know what's going on. You know, I mean. <laughs> Let alone all the digital stuff, <laughs> you know. Like I mean, it's, you're just bombarded by it. And I wonder if it would deepen the experience of having less experience, uh, having less variety, just because then you're able to say, okay, this this is it. This is in my niche. I'm not, I don't have to worry about something where there's 20 more sort of like it. Well, that that's why marketing is so important, and that's why the the big companies have an advantage because they have the funds to spend to create the awareness. So the difference between you know one thing and another thing is that you know about this because you were advertised or you were made aware through some very expensive advertising campaign. So some indie film might be equally as good as a studio film, but nobody's ever going to know about it. That's the difference. So, and that's why you know a lot of services are still driven by advertising because I guess it works, right? People still, you know, get affected by that. Yeah, well, in the pandemic during, you know, I mean, normally 
you would go to an art house theater and you would see different things on the marquee that, that you could look up and say, okay, this looks like a good one. Now it's great because these independent film trailers, they'll suggest a similar one. And so there's films that I see from a couple years ago that I had no idea existed. That yeah. Maybe they didn't make it to the front page of Netflix. So, so let me ask you this. So are you happy? I mean, what they're doing basically, you know, is YouTube, let's say, let's use YouTube as an example. You know, we can use any of these digital sites, um, is profiling you. Sure. And I realize that. Yeah. I have are a you, footprint. Yeah. But you're happy with that because now they're recommending stuff to you that you wouldn't otherwise know about that. I'm happy with that part, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, am I. Yeah. I actually am too. Right, People right. say, oh, your privacy is being invaded and everything like that. I say, yeah, it is, but you know what? Yeah. They're, they're actually doing me a favor and they're showing me things that I wouldn't otherwise discover. Sure, yeah. They know they know that I'm going to like certain things. And yeah, I'm, now I get these ads for different things that it's like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, I guess... I guess I am in that demographic, but yeah. the 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 movies that that the the creative stuff I like. So do I. Yeah, and you know you're gonna get bombarded with a lot of ads and stuff like that, and you know, and they're gonna try to move you psychologically oh, yeah. in a different direction. Sure. We all know about that stuff, which is not great. But there is the 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 flip side where you know you are creating they're creating some convenience for you. Yeah, and I do like that part. And and there's some great indie trailers and sometimes it's fun to just spend a night just watching a bunch of indie trailers. Like going down that rabbit hole one yeah. to the next to the next and yeah, you'd never get there otherwise. No, no. And you and you couldn't get there. and I did enjoy going to Blockbuster and trying to find some obscure film. I didn't want the ones that were there were 20 of them yeah. on one wall. Yeah. But but this this there's more discovery here. I yeah. Have to say. Well, that's like an event. It's like walking down the back aisles of the blockbuster store, seeing all the titles you've never looked at, picking them up. Now you just do it digitally. Sure. And not only that, you don't even have to move because they put it all in front of you, one after the other. Right. They serve it up to you. Should a filmmaker sell their movie or license their movie? Do you know the difference legally? Should I explain that? Would you? <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you. Okay. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, it's a license. This is the legal terminology, okay? I use the term sell very loosely, and a lot of people do, but the legal terminology of a sale means that you are actually giving up the copyright, the ownership of the movie. So it used to be called a negative pickup, where you would pick up the asset of the film. You're, you're, you're taking the asset, the ownership of the asset, which a lot of people refer to as the copyright, which is the ownership of the asset, and you're giving it to somebody else, and they're paying you for it. So now you don't have any ownership of it anymore. That's a sale. It's super rare that that had a lot. Studios, when they sell their library, their catalog, you know, their, their company, that's a sale, right? 99% of the time, you're doing a license where what you're saying is, here's my asset. You can borrow it for this period of time, for this amount of money, and then when that expires, you give it back to me. That's a license. And you're, you know, you're not really giving them the asset. You're letting them use that for their viewers. So it's like renting a house versus selling it in some sense. Yeah, exactly. And so eventually the rights are going to revert back to the that, owner that's, once well, your lease is up. It's, it's a little different. The, it, the rights never revert. I mean, all you're doing, you always own the movie on a license. You're just giving them, okay, there is rights. You're giving them the right to, to, to um, expose the movie to their customer base or to, you know, in, in some case, let's say let's let's go with an extreme example where you're licensing it to a, say back then in the DV in the product side of the business to a DVD, you know, to a, a, a distribution company, and they're going to make DVDs. So you're giving them the right to make put your movie on a DVD disc and sell it to you know Walmart, who will sell it to the world, right? And that right, the consumer when they buy it will always get to own that right to watch your movie on that disc. But they don't have the right to sell it to anybody else, to replicate the disc, to air it in a movie theater. And they only have the right to own that and watch it when they want to watch it. That's the extent of the license agreement. And then when the period runs out from the distributor, they can't make any more DVDs. They give it back to you. Okay, now in the case of digital distribution, they have the right to say send out a streaming link or you know or put it onto a streaming platform you know or like an iTunes or Netflix or something like that for a certain period of time and when it expires they lose that right and but there's never transfer of ownership only in a sale that's the difference between sale and license is ownership it speaks to ownership and and before 
streaming services did a lot of filmmakers used to sell their films? Let's say when the VHS market or even uh, remember video discs, were, were filmmakers selling or, or licensing? Was it the same thing back then? Hopefully they were licensing. It's not a good practice to sell your rights, like to sell your, your asset. There's no reason you need to. I mean, generally, if somebody wants to own it, you can just make a long licensing deal, like 25 years or some crazy thing like that, you know, or 50 years or, or what, or, or there are licensing deals, a lot of them called in perpetuity, meaning forever. So they actually never buy the asset, but they have the right to, to uh, exploit it forever. So they might as well own it, but it's just easier to just do the license deal. Can any movie get the attention of a distributor or are distributors only looking for certain kinds of movies? It's not certain kinds of movies. It's at certain quality levels, certain budget levels. I mean, generally shorts aren't going to get the time of day from a distributor because it's hard to monetize them. Gen anything less than a feature is probably not going to be handled by a distributor because they don't have any place to sell it. The they're just looking for stuff they can sell, something that is, you know, commercially viable. So if they don't think it's commercially viable, they're not going to look at it. And generally anything shorter than a feature is, is being tough to sell. There's not really a market for short. I mean, there's a viewing market for it, but not a, not a consuming, like not a purchasing market. So when you say a certain quality, um, is a distributor wanting to know the budget of something before they'll even look at the trailer? No, they want to know the quality. The budget is in some ways inconsequential. That could be a, some really, really talented filmmakers can make fantastic films on super low budgets. Some unso, you know, not so good filmmakers spend a fortune to make sh crappy films. It's about the quality of the film. Okay, everybody lies about the budget anyway, so you never know what's real. Um, it, the only thing you know is you watch the movie and you say, "Hey, this looks really good." And who cares what they made it for? Honestly, who really cares as long as it's entertaining? So the two things people lie about in Hollywood: budget and their age. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the interesting thing is they go high on the budget and low on the age. <laughs> How many times do you see filmmakers make a film with zero attention to their distribution plan? Most of the time. Almost all of the time, actually. Yeah. I mean, th th that's most of what I consult on. I mean, almost all my consulting is, let's talk about how you're going to sell the movie. And hopefully they call me to consult before they make the movie. And, you know, people say, like, why are we talking about this? And I said, because the first question I ask is, do you want to make money with your movie? Do you have an intention to sell your movie for money? If they say no, then I said, you know, we don't have to have this conversation. We can just talk about artistic stuff if you want. But if the answer is yes, then, then we talk about marketing and distribution long before we talk about production. And most filmmakers don't talk about it. For two reasons, one, well, three reasons. One is they don't think to talk about it. You know, they don't really know that that's a question that you have to ask before the fact. Two is they can't stand the whole distribution business. I mean, it just, it's just such a turnoff, you know, because it's not what they do. They make movies. They don't sell movies, you know. And three is it's, you know, it's something. It's almost denial because, like I said, you got to spend a lot of money on marketing and it's a whole business and everything like that. And that might, you know, destroy the whole project. If, if I said, hey, go raise as much money for marketing as you are for production, that's like a non-starter. But it shouldn't be, because that's the business. Do most people contact you after the fact, after they've tried to get this film out? You know, they've already had their party, they've already had their festival yeah. run. Yeah, that, yes, they do. And that's because they didn't know to contact me before. Now, a lot, a lot of the newer clients are starting to contact me first because they're watching some of my videos and, and some of my materials and stuff. And, and a lot of people on the internet are talking about that. But not, to, not too many people are doing it. They're just going through the motions and talking about it. Because how many indie filmmakers you know who actually started their career in distribution? Because like, like I said, it's crazy to go from distribution to production. I mean, I can see going the other way around. I mean, it's crazy. It's just, you know, it's very rare that that would happen. Um, so it's kind of unique that I would understand distribution and have a really soft spot for indie filmmakers because I am one of them. And like, 
the thing, one of the things I enjoy the most is almost like, and this maybe is the legal part of me kicking in, is I love to defend an indie filmmaker in a distribution negotiation. I love that. It's my favorite thing. I love to sit beside them and listen to the distributor explain how the deal is going to work and then kind of pull them aside and explain how the deal really works and what really is going to go on. And then sometimes they'll say, okay, Jeff, you say it because I won't say it properly. Or sometimes I won't even be in the room. They'll call me or whatever, or they'll send me their contract, their deal memo. And then I love to renegotiate the deal and say, okay, how about this? Let me give you a perfect example, okay? So every distributor, if you've ever been in one of these distribution, sure, an indie filmmaker just made a, a feature. It's a good feature. You know it's a good feature. And you want to make money with it. So you're going to go, you get lucky, you get into, you know, say five distribution meetings with reputable distributors. All right, don't ask how they got there and you do it, okay? You get into the first meeting, here's how it goes. And I'm going to shorten this, okay? It's a lot longer. You know, pleasantries, how are you? Da, 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 great film, da, 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 Okay. All right, we're going to make you a great offer. All right. We're going to give you, it's going to be a 10 year deal exclusively. And we're going to give you $200,000 minimum guarantee up front against, um, we're going to take a 30% fee and 10% costs. No, they, sorry, they don't say costs. We're going to take a 30% fee plus our costs. And we're going to give you $200,000 up front. Sound good? Sounds good. I'll take it. Really? <laughs> okay. Now you phone me. Now they, they, okay. they give you the deal memo. They send it to me. I say, first question, how much did it cost you to make the movie? 800000 I said, okay, they're giving you 200000 I know, but they're going to, they, they also said they're going to, you know, they're the best in the business and they're going to generate $2 million in sales. They're going to take 30%. So I'm going to get 70% of $2 million, $1.4 million. And they gave me 200,000 up front, so I'm going to get another 1.2 million. So that's a good deal, really good. I said, okay, what if they don't? Oh, but they said they would. Okay, they also, and here's what I say. So I say, let me go in and have a conversation. So I get there and I say, okay, are you, you're the distributor. Are you the best in the business? Absolutely, we're the best. And we, we've been at 25 years, we've sold 500 movies, we are the best. Good, because I only want to deal with the best. I don't want to deal with second rate guys. I'm glad we're sitting here. You're the best. I want to deal with you. You're here. You're, you're dealing with the best. Great. Okay. What do you think you can sell in the movie? Well, we told we said we can do two million dollars in sales. And by the way, that's a low estimate. We didn't want to tell them we're probably going to do five million, but we want to be conservative because we don't want to give the filmmakers, you know, like bad expectations. But we can do $2 million in sales, gross sales on this. Really? That's good. And it's likely going to be a lot more, but let's go with that number. I say, fantastic. You're going to take a 30% fee. So you're going to deliver $1.4 million back, right? You are the best. And that's a low estimate. Why'd you only give them 200000 up front? I got, a, I got a, this crazy idea. You're the best. You know exactly what you're doing. And... You're going to do $2 million in sales with your eyes closed. That's going to be a walk in the park because you're actually going to do more. You're going to generate $1.4 million. How about this? Why don't we just split the difference and give us $700,000 up front as a minimum guarantee? Half of what you're going to do as a no-brainer. And you're the best at it. Oh, no, no. We can't do that. Why not? Well, what if it doesn't sell? Of course it's going to sell. You just told us it's going to sell for $2 million and you told us you're the best. But what if it doesn't sell? But no, no, no. no. But I, I, I don't want to deal with somebody who's not going to sell it. You're the best. That's why I'm here. And the two million is nothing. Like it's, it's a walk in the... It's, those are your words, not mine. Well, but maybe it might not sell. Well, then I don't want to deal with you because you're not the best and you're not telling me the right numbers. That's how a negotiation goes. Okay, so you're the distributor. What do you do? Do you give an extra $500,000, half of what your projection is? Or do you stick to the 200 and walk away from the deal? You likely stick to the 200 and walk away from the deal. Why? Because you know you're, you're not going to hit that number. If you knew darn well, if you had those sales in your pocket already, you'd give the 700,000 in a heartbeat. 
because you've already pre-sold it. You already know what to expect. And if and when you're in that situation, you can get that kind of deal. But most indie filmmakers will never be in that situation. They don't have that kind of leverage, okay? Because they're new at the game and they one is they don't know what to ask for. So they would never have that kind of conversation because that would be way too, you know, too aggressive. Okay, then, then you get into costs. You said you're gonna take your costs. How much are your costs? Well, they're gonna be around 10 to 12 percent. For what? Well, we have delivery and all this kind of stuff. I, say, show, I need a delivery schedule. I need to know what it is. I want to cap you at 5 percent. No, 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 no. And by the way, 10 years? Why do you need 10 years? I mean, how long is it gonna take you to sell? You could probably sell in three years. Well, you know, just in case. All these just in cases. I just spent $800,000 making my movie. I didn't get any just in cases from anybody. Why do you need all these just in cases? Now, the problem with what I'm telling you is it's easy for me to say that because I did that for a living. For I sat on the other side of that table for 22 years. So I know exactly how that game is played and everything like that. And I'm being, you know, a little cocky about it, right? You do that as a filmmaker, they'll escort you out of their office and never want to do business with you because you're pushing them too hard. But that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the true deal and that's the true way a negotiation should go in that situation. But they have all the leverage, so they don't go that way. Unless you got a really good film. And if you got a really good film, then you need to work it. It just all depends on, and do you know how you know if you have a really good film? Whether they want it or not. So you gotta push that envelope a bit. You gotta believe in yourself and in your product and you gotta push it and you can't just take the first deal they put on the table because it's usually gonna be a crappy deal and you're gonna end up losing a ton of money. Because in some ways you also have to assume that you're not gonna see another penny after that minimum guarantee unless you also build in, there's lots of stuff you have to build in, performance guarantees, they have to performance thresholds, they have to hit certain levels within certain time frames. otherwise that's a breach of the contract. There's all this stuff, they hate me. The distributors hate me because I'm one of them. They don't even, uh, some of these new distributors, they don't even know some of the questions that I, like some of the terms that I put in. I tuck them in and say like, where'd this come from? But you know what? You get one shot at it. You're a filmmaker, you put your heart, so this is why I have a real soft spot for filmmakers because I know how much time, effort, and money they put into the, and the heart and soul they put into making their film. Then they walk into these meetings and get railroaded absolutely railroad it just because they don't know what to ask or how to ask for it and how to push push the issue because they're too scared to lose the deal and so they end up taking a really really bad deal and in some ways it's better not to take any deal and try for the next deal now will the next deal come along maybe maybe not but basically what you're saying is you've throwing it up in the air and giving it away and and knowing that you're never gonna like a bad deal is not worth taking unless you're totally, totally desperate and there's no other deal to take. Then you can take a bad deal. But when you're first starting out and you're getting in and you have a good film, you made a good film, work it. Anyways, listen, easier said than done. I feel super confident working it because I, I know all the terms, I know all this. You know what? I got a better idea. Call me and I'll work it for you. Okay? I will work the deal for you. That's what I like to do. Like as I said, one of my favorite things is helping a inexperienced, really good artistic but inexperienced filmmaker in terms of distribution negotiate a deal. I like doing that. You said performance guarantee that they have, I know you said a minimum guarantee, yeah. which is yeah. called an MG? An MG. MG. Yeah, MG. Performance guarantee, what, what does that entail? Okay, it's, it's something I think I made up to be honest with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I made it up many years ago. Um, I gave it a name. but. I, People do it, but but I do it a lot. Um, first of all, let's, let me just define minimum guarantee so everybody understands. So you're going to get, say, 70% of the revenue, which maybe we can negotiate down to, or up to 75%. And that's called royalties or producer share. Some people in a production, in a distribution call it producer share or royalties. Okay, that's what you're going to get. That's the producer's take revenue. And, in, and a minimum guarantee or an MG is what they will give you up front against that. So if you're gonna get 1.4 million total and they gave you 200,000, that was your minimum guarantee. So now they're only gonna give you another 1.2. The first $200,000 that they earned, they've already paid you up front. That's a minimum guarantee, okay? A performance guarantee or a performance threshold. So I built these into my contracts years ago. 
I'm giving away a really good trade secret here. So everybody pay attention when I say this, all right? You want to deal with a good, reputable distributor. And as I said, I've just played the game. You're the best, right? If you're the best, how long is it going to take you to generate that million dollars in sales? It's, you, you say it's going to take you two years. And I'm going to say, why is it going to take you so long? You're in the, every market, you know, every customer, you can make phone calls. Well, it's probably going to take a year, but we need to have two years. Say, how about this? I'll give you 18 months. And if you don't have $700,000 of gross sales contracted, and I get to see the contracts, you have to share them with me by 18 months from now, then I have the option to terminate the contract. We'll consider that a technical breach, and I have, it's my option to terminate because you are not performing at the level that you just promised me you would perform at. That's what I call a performance threshold. And I, I build those in, and a lot of distributors say, sorry, no deal because they're not confident. They don't want to be held to that. And I say, you want my film? That's, I expect you to be able to do what you say you're going to do. And that's my guarantee that you'll, that's my out if you don't do it. I'm not saying I'm going to necessarily exercise. It's an option. So it's my option, not yours. I have an exclusive option to walk away from the deal. And, and at that point, there's termination, you know, language. Okay, I get this, you get this, you know, we, you know, this is how it all resolves itself. And how, if they agreed to that term, how would I know? Could I call up and, and it would be no, documented? they have to. Part of that term is they have to give you transparency and visibility to the deals they've done, which they're supposed to do anyways. That's called reporting. You're supposed to have that because they're reporting to you. And on, an, on a new distribution contract, they're supposed to report to you. They should report to you quarterly every three months for the first two years. You should expect that. So it's not like you're not going to have visibility to that anyways. It's just what level you're going to hit in your reporting. This is a serious, serious distribution term that nobody really does that because they're too scared to do it or they, they haven't thought about it or, or distributors say no way. So most independent filmmakers, they don't want to rock the boat and they don't know what they don't know. Okay. Most independent filmmakers, they don't even want to get involved in this. This is like doing surgery. You know, like a, you know, a nurse doing surgery. It's, it's just not what they do. They don't want to do it. They don't want to take a chance. They don't want to get involved and they can't stand the idea of doing it. Okay. Secondly, even if they were to get involved, they didn't go to medical. They didn't go to, they didn't learn surgery. So they don't know what to do. Even if they have the desire to do it, they don't know what to do. So they don't have the technical know-how to know what to ask for. And it's not their fault. They don't teach it in film school. The only way to learn that is to actually be in the, in, the, in the business and learn it the hard way. I didn't, you know, I didn't come into law school and know that. I had to work in distribution. It took me five years to learn all this stuff. So is it reasonable to expect that a lot of filmmakers will be taken advantage of for their first distribution deal? It's not only reasonable, but it's probable. It's, it's highly, highly likely. And, it's, and, and I said on another podcast, it's not that the distributors are evil people. But they, they're in business. They're in business to make the best deal that they can make for themselves. And if the person on the other side doesn't ask for the right things, you know, it's not their obligation to put it on the table. So they're dealing, it's a little bit of an unfair negotiation because they have an advantage of having more knowledge and more experience than the person on the other side. And that's why sometimes it's good to go into these negotiations with somebody who knows what they're doing, like a lawyer or a consultant or something like that. Because even though you're going to pay a fee for that, you're going to end up with a much better deal. And you're not going to get screwed. So it's not that they're omitting information. They're just not suggesting it? That's or correct. Is it, they're not okay. putting it on the table. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, and in some cases I will say they're purposely not putting it on the table because they know they don't have to. They're not being nice about it. They're not being sympathetic knowing that the guy on the other side knows nothing. Sure. They're just so excited. And most indie filmmakers are so excited to just have the, the, the meeting. And then to get any deal, that's usually the case. They're just like, just so eager to just get any deal, which is too bad. But it's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. How much time should a filmmaker expect to put into distribution versus pre-production or production? Great question. So I, I, in my world, in my experience, having made seven features, takes me about a year to make the movie. 
by the time I'm, I'm talking from idea to final delivery. That's about a year. So there's about a month or two in idea development stage. There's probably two to three months in financing. There is a month or two in pre-production. There is a month or two in production. And then there's, you know, I didn't do the math on it, probably about six months in post-production and delivery. So that's the production phase. Distribution, minimum, well, it's, see, distribution is not full-time. Production, what I just described, is full-time. You're, well, maybe not development isn't full-time, where you're working on it 100% of the time, but, but production certainly is, and post-production, if you're doing your own edit, you know, certainly is, right? Um, distribution is full-time when you're at markets and, and when you're preparing and everything. There's about, I'm going to say, f four to five months of full-time prep for distribution getting well mind you if you if you've done it many times you have all your lists all together and you know who your customers are and you're prepping your materials and you, hopefully your trailer's already made from production i always cut my trailer first before i cut my movie and yeah because you need to have a trailer uh, you change it as you go along too um, but um, artwork and and um, whatever you know presentation materials you want to have you don't need a ton you just have some photos and stuff like that um, and then you spend, you know, the first four to five months putting it out to the marketplace, um, perhaps going to a, a market, and we'll talk about markets versus festivals in a second, and then, you know, and soliciting it to whoever your lists are. If Oh, this is self-distribution, by the way. Um, if you're doing through a distributor, then you're putting it out to distributors. And you, you want to put it out to, you know, I'm going to say 25 to 50 distributors if, if you can. That seems like a lot, but... Uh, you know, and you have your short list of, say, top 10 who you really, really care about. Um, and then you put it out to all these other ones. And it's not just American. If you're an American producer, you don't just put them out to American distributors. You, there's tons of distributors in the UK, Australia, you know, who all speak English and who do worldwide distribution. So the world is, you know, is a big place now and you can deal pretty well in any country. Um, but then distribution goes on for, you know, three to four years. I mean, it goes on your whole life, really. I mean, as long as you own your film, it's, you know, as long as your asset is in existence and you haven't sold it and it's yours, then you technically can monetize it the rest of your life. That's what they call library rights. I mean, you're just hopefully continuing to monetize it. It's not as active and robust generally the second or third time around, you know, after the first year is when most of the sales happen or the first yeah, the first 12 to 24 months, most of your sales are going to happen if people want to buy it. It's, it takes customers, used to take them like three to four months to make a decision. Now it takes them like six to eight months. It's amazing. You think, here's a film, watch it. Do you want it or you don't want it? You think that should take an evening, right? Um, it takes a long time. The, these lead times are, are a long time. You have to have a lot of patience. But generally within the first two years, you're going to have exhausted all of, or your distributor will have exhausted all of the sales contacts and done what I call round one, made all the rounds, gotten all the answers back, and you know if it's sold or not. And then after that, again, it's your asset and you, it never ends. And deliverables are done by the filmmaker or if you get a distributor, they will do some of the deliverable work. So here's the thing. The, the distributor definitely will do the deliverables, but you will pay them to do the deliverables. Everything the distributor does, you're going to pay for. And not only will you pay for the actual physical deliverable, but you will pay a fee for them to do that because it costs them time and you know effort to do it. So for instance, let's say, let's use dubs, okay? Let's say you have to do language dubs, right? The distributor themselves is, aren't going to make the language dubs. They don't do that. They don't have you know, in-house dubbing facilities. Maybe one or two do, but most of them don't, okay? They're gonna go to an outside third-party dubbing company you know, who makes language versioning, and they're gonna hire them, and they're gonna tell them exactly what they need to do, and then they're gonna let them do it, and they're gonna pay a fee to them to do it. And the distributor's gonna negotiate that fee, and then they're gonna pay the fee to them, and then they're going to charge it back to you through the revenue that comes back to your film. But in addition to the fee they pay to the versioning company, they're also going to take a fee for themselves for managing it. Maybe 
an additional 10%, 20%. So let's say there's $100,000 in language dubbing. The distributor might add on another you know, fifteen dollars to $20,000 in their labor to manage that process. So the bill you're going to get is $120,000 as opposed to $100,000 if you put it out to the same versioning company yourself. But if you were to do that, then one, you need to know what versioning companies to go to and who to ask and make sure you do the do it the proper way and get the right companies on board because you know versioning is a very particular thing. Um, and two, you have to have the cash flow because now the versioning company is going to charge you $100,000 and you need to pay them $100,000 cash. The distributor has the cash, they'll pay the $100,000 on your behalf, but it'll cost you an extra $20,000, but it's often worth it because you don't have the cash. Are some of these bills from the distributor set against potential profit? Or will you actually get a bill in the mail that you're like needing to write a check for? So it's with a good distribution deal, everything should be um, recouped against revenue, not profit, revenue. So as revenue comes in, the way the way most distribution deals work is um, it's called a waterfall. All right. So revenue comes in. So let me use a hundred dollars. Make it real simple, okay? A hundred dollars comes in the door. If they're working on a 30% fee, then the first $30 goes to them of the hundred, to the distributor. All right? Then if they have costs of say 20, $20, then the next $20 comes off of that to pay for their costs. All right, so now they take the, they recoup their costs. So now there's $50 left. Then if they have given you say a minimum guarantee of $10, right, then they're gonna recoup that. So they paid you 10 already, so they're gonna take the $10 back. So now there's, they've taken 60, there's $40 left. And then you're gonna get that $40. That's how that works. So probably. Okay, but oh, yeah. oh, oh, mm -hmm. I forgot to say. Okay, yeah. now let's say, let's say that they have costs of seventy dollars. So they took eighty dollars. Let's say eighty dollars. So they took thirty because there was languaging versioning, right? So the a hundred dollars came in, and they took thirty dollars as their fee, but their costs were actually call it ninety dollars they spent to make some languaging versions. But there's only seventy dollars less, so they take the they take the red seventy, but you still owe them twenty dollars. They're still out of pocket twenty dollars. So the question is, did they send you a bill for twenty dollars? And the answer is hopefully not. Hopefully they wait until the next revenue comes in, because that's the way a good distribution deal should have been negotiated. But maybe they do. I mean, filmmakers have told me they've gotten those kind of bills. They shouldn't. It should be against the revenue that's coming in. But sometimes they do. Is there language that one should look out for to make sure that it's set against potential revenue? Of course there is. 100% there's language. There's language for everything. And you have to be super particular with your language. I mean, that's, that's why you need somebody who knows what they're doing to make sure your language is proper. And, and the distributors play games with the language. All lawyers play games with language. What do you mean by it purposely confusing people? Remember, I said it before, distributors in business to make money. Their job isn't to rip off the next person, but it's to do the best deal that they possibly can. So you need to make sure that your job is to do the best deal you can for yourself. Just, you know, you don't know as much as they do. So make sure you get somebody who does know so that you can make sure that you address all those issues to your benefit, or at least make them fair and so they're not skewed in their favor. Should one be afraid of a short contract? A short term on the contract? No, just in terms of like it's only one page and, and really one that's more elaborate is actually more beneficial? No, oh, no. Okay. Um, the substantive deal terms, depending on the size of the font, can fit onto one page. Oh, okay. I and mean, there's about seven or eight substantive deal terms and they generally can fit onto one page. I call those deal memos or, you know, I mean, that's, or that's more or less what we call them, deal memos. And often, I mean, most of my distribution contracts are only two pages. And then the last paragraph, or the last sentence says, um, a long form will follow if the, you know, there's an option for the long form to follow. The long form, which, you know, is 40 to 50 pages, is a lot of legal jargon built up over years and years and years. 
It's a lot of accounting and, and, and termination language, which is super important. But often a deal memo will say, you know, and the rest of the terms per industry standard, per reasonable industry standard. Um, and, you know, sometimes you'll attach an addendum to it. But you need a deal memo at first. The major terms are, you know, how long the deal is going to be. That's the period or the term, the period, right? Um, what the royalty level is going to be, like what their fees, either what their fees going to be, what they're going to take or how much they're going to give you, their costs, what their costs are going to be, are they capped? Um, is there, I put in a performance threshold, are there performance thresholds? Um, what the territory is going to be, like where they're selling it for, what the rights are, are you giving them all the rights or just um, certain rights, you know, just for certain, you know, broadcast or streaming or whatever? Um, is it exclusive or non-exclusive and what the language is going to be? When you say language, you mean language of languages of, of languages, and who's going to do transcripts or dubbing? No, it's just what language rights you're giving them, and then you'll figure that all out in costs and everything. Yeah, and then you'd probably put down, okay, who's gonna, yeah, you'd probably say who's going to who's going to incur this. And d does a distributor um, have the right to change the name of the to like the title of the film if they feel that in a certain territory it will do better? Or they, that has they, have, to... they have the right if you give them the right. Oh, okay. That's It's your choice. If you want to grant them that right, they'll tell you you should grant them because they know better and that will help market the film better. And in a lot of cases, I would agree with that. Um, but they only have the right if you grant it to them. They, they don't have any rights other than what you negotiate. It's all, And that's why deal memos are very long and complicated because over the years, there's been a lot of stuff negotiated that lawyers tend to put in we call those boilerplate clauses over and over and over. If this happens, then that happens, then this happens. And you know, it depends who drafted the contract. Generally, a distributor wants to use a contract that they drafted because they trusted and they negotiated it over the years and they built it over the years. They're not too receptive for you bringing in your own distribution contract because it won't be as generally as favorable to them or they have to spend a lot of time reviewing it to make sure that it's fair. And the best is, you know, the Netflix contract. <laughs> I love Netflix. They're, they're actually super reasonable, believe it or not. They actually care about filmmakers, which you'd be surprised, but they do. Um, but there's no negotiating. I mean, the, the lawyer said to me on the, the business affairs person, who's a lawyer on the other side, said, um, and, you know, and I said, I'm going to do my own legals because I'm a lawyer and I'm confident that I know what I'm doing. Um, she said, is there anything like you'd like to address? And I said, if there was, would it matter? And she said, kind of not. <laughs> <laughs> what are the top five things a filmmaker should look for in a distributor? The first one I would say for any business deal, but it's really, really hard to gauge, is honesty. Like, how do you gauge honesty? How do you gauge that in a partner? How do you gauge that in a friend, you know, in, a, in anybody? So it would be great if there was an honesty test but honesty is the most important thing. Like trust slash honesty. You just want to do business with people who you can trust and who you think will be honest with you. So sometimes you would gauge it through reputation. You might ask other filmmakers, you know, how they did, you know, like you can say to the distributor, who else did you distribute for? Can you give me some references, some other filmmakers? Of course, they'll give you the ones that went well, not the ones that were mad at them. Um, but you could ask, you can go on a website, you know, their website, see all the different films, maybe look up some of the producers of those other films and you know and email them or phone them contact them and say hey did you get a fair deal how did it go and get it that's how you would gauge that but then again that's perspective from somebody else but at least it gives you a sort of a, a good test um their business acumen like do they seem professional does their website look professional is do their is their office organized are they uh, you know, professional and getting back to you on time and communicating with you. Um, you can sort of tell if, if uh, people are acting professionally or not. And if they're not professional, chances are they're maybe not professional with their clients and they're going to be a pain to deal with. So hopefully, they don't have to be the biggest and most, the nicest office. They don't have to have expensive offices in Beverly Hills. They just, it's got to be, seem to be organized and they, it, you have to get the impression that they know what they're doing. You know, and that they treat you with some respect, hopefully. Even if you're not the biggest client, you know, it's how hard is it to return, you know, an email or something like that? Um, what is their breadth, their reach into the marketplace? 
Have they been at it for a while? Do they have the customer base that they actually say? Can they get to streamers? Can they get to broadcasters? Can they get to international territories? Do they really, can they really do what they claim they're gonna do? And so that's also maybe a question you ask some other filmmakers or you know, maybe you could look them up. Um, you go, it's amazing when you Google people you know, and companies what you can find out. Um, I happen, it's easier for me because I go to the markets. So like I see if they're there. I see if they have booths there. I see what their stands look like. I, you know, I see them in cocktail parties and meetings. You know, it's, it's much easier when you're in the business to know if they're in the business and sort of what their breadth is. And you can also talk to other people, like other producers in other countries and stuff like that and say, do you, or other distributors, do you know them, have they done business, what do you think, da 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 da. So you can also try to gauge that as much as possible. Um, their, their track record on reporting, reporting's a big thing because even if they're doing the business and they're not telling you about it, you know, it's aggravating. I'd say that's one of the major complaints that, dis, that indie film producers have with distributors is they don't report. You never know what's going on. And uh, when they do report, it's usually <laughs> fabricated. You know, so that's the honesty thing we talked about before. Um, so you want to see that what their reports look like, that they, you know, you, you want to sort of get some type of indication that they're going to be regular and honest with you. And then the last one would be, I guess their distribution deal, what kind of deal they're offering, you know? Does it feel like it's a fair deal? Do they feel like they're trying to hose you? Do you feel like you can even make any money with it? Um, again, they're in business to do the best deal that they can for themselves, but do they, does it feel like, you know, you have a shot with them? And hopefully you need to get some advice to make sure that you make the right deal with them because it's not their responsibility for you to make the right deal. I mean, some people take it upon themselves to make sure that the deal's totally fair. I mean, I have this adage that I always said, I'm really big on fairness. Fairness is a huge theme for me in my life. I always say a good deal, and I learned this on the distribution side, not on the production side. A fair deal, not a good deal. A good deal is whatever works for you. A fair deal is one where you sit on this side of the table and you negotiate and you you have to, con everybody compromises, but you, you get to something that you're comfortable with and then you switch places and on that side of the table, you're equally comfortable. And both people feel equally compromised, but equally comfortable. That's a fair deal. It's unfair when somebody gets it all and somebody is left with nothing. And it doesn't have to be equal. They just, you just have to feel that it's fair. How can a filmmaker negotiate a fair deal with a distributor? Well, in order to negotiate a fair deal, you got to know what to ask for. I mean, if you don't ask for the right things, you're probably not going to get them. Like fair is fair, right? The, it's, I, I keep saying it's not the distributor's obligation to make sure you get the fair deal. It's your obligation. So you have to either surround yourself with people who know what they're doing or figure it out yourself. Know what you're doing. That's any negotiation. You got to know what to ask for or you're not going to get it. Don't assume somebody's going to put it on the table unless you ask for it. So, you know, you got to do some homework or you got to hire somebody to do it for you. Then don't get mad if you got a bad deal because maybe you didn't no. ask for the right thing. No, you're allowed to get mad. Everybody gets mad. I mean, that's part of being human. Um, but be mad at yourself. That's who you need to be mad at. at mad at yourself. I mean, you know, it's hard to get mad at yourself when you, you didn't even know. You know? How, like it's not like you knew and you left it out you forgot you didn't even know so you're mad I guess at the circumstances but it's your obligation as a it's your obligation to your movie say your movie is like your child and you want to protect it it's your obligation to protect your movie and make sure that you either let somebody who knows what they're doing do it for you or or know what you're doing figure it out and don't be don't don't leave yourself short. So no one's going to come in and say, you know, well, listen, we're not being fair on our end. Really, what we should mo most most filmmakers get this, even if the filmmaker on the other end of the table didn't ask for that. If you didn't ask for it, kind of like all f is fair in war and love, then it's not going to happen for you. You have to really know what it is that you are actually defending against or trying to get 
and they're not going to suggest it for you. Listen, mo most distribution agreements should start off relatively reasonable, relatively, but they're not always. It's your obligation to make sure that you get it to the total reasonable and fair place. Sure. I mean, I would think after years and years and years of doing it that distributors would hopefully not take too much advantage, but they do. And, and, and it's, it's not their fault. You, you, you got to look at you spent all this time, effort and money making your movie. Spend a little bit of money getting it represented properly and distributed properly. It's just as important. In some ways, it's more important. How much revenue do you think my movie can generate? Is this a smart question for a filmmaker to ask to a distributor or will this alienate them? That's a vital question to ask. That's the whole point of the distribution deal is how much you're going to how much money they're going to generate. You need to ask that question. And you need to hear what they answer and you need to have them justify why they answered it. And you know, maybe they'll compare it to other stuff that they've distributed or other stuff that's been in the marketplace. That's the essence of the deal. It's the essence of the whole relationship is how much are they going to generate? It's not, oh, you nice guys, you're going to go to film markets and have some martinis and and chit chat about my film. Who cares about that? How much you're going to make? That's what I really need to know. You need to ask that. And by the way, you should probably, if you really want to push the deal, and don't worry about alienating. If you're going to alienate people that easily, don't do business with them. It's all business. It's not personal. That's what they do for a living. You're asking them, okay, here's what you do for a living. Can you tell me what I can expect for you to do for me for a living? That's not an alienating question at all. And if you really want to push the envelope, have them put it in writing in as an addendum. Here's the fork, the projections that we're projecting. Now, they're not going to guarantee, well, they'll guarantee it in a minimum guarantee. So you try to get as much of that, like they'll give you low, medium, and high forecasts. Um, they'll probably go with the medium, and you try to get as much of that in a minimum guarantee as possible. That's the secret. But beyond the minimum guarantee, probably can't give you an absolute number. And if they did, would that would that be honest? No, they give you a forecast. It's you know, like it's any business. I mean, you know, it, it's based on our experience, based on you know the marketplace and the conditions and everything like that. The buyers, this is what we estimate we're going to generate for you on this film, and based on you know the quality of your film. Here's our forecast for your film, but they're just forecasts. So we hopefully we'll be close to them. Hopefully we'll exceed them, but. It's just an idea of what to expect. It's a, it's, it's a ballpark, a range. Are most new independent filmmakers afraid to ask that question? Yes, of course they are. Most new independent filmmakers are afraid to ask anything to a distributor because they're totally intimidated by distributors because they think distributors are, for some reason, you know, smarter, the holy grail, or they're the business people. So you don't ask the business, you don't question the business people. You got to question everything. And by the way, what they do is a fraction of what you've done as an indie filmmaker. What you've done in making a movie so far surpasses the amount of, 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 of passion and, and hard work that any distributor is ever going to do. And I can speak from experience. I know what it takes to get a film made and I know what it takes to get a film sold. Now, selling is a very, very long process and very difficult and you have to be super persistent and you have to be able to take a lot of rejection. Making is super intense. I mean, staying focused on story and, and set and actors and all this kind of stuff and, and, and just getting it all together and delivering a great product. So they're different, you know, disciplines and they're both important. But don't ever think what a distributor does is any more difficult than what you do. And don't ever be intimidated. I mean, I can't say you're going to be intimidated by them. They're going to push you. They're going to tell you things. They're going to say, and that's why, that's why Lawyers and consultants exist so that you can take somebody in who, an, an agent. That's what these people do. They just say things to other people that you might be too intimidated to say to them. So you pay somebody else to say it. And hopefully they're thinking something else. Is intimidation and, and rejection a muscle that can be worked? <laughs> I mean, that, this is way beyond film discussion. <laughs> this is this is uh, human behavior, but um, certainly. Did you say intimidation and rejection? Okay, let's talk about rejection. 
if you don't have the capacity to deal with rejection, you can't be in the film business. You can't, you can't be in the indie part of the film business. You can work in the film. You can, you know, be a, you know, gripper, gaffer, or something like that. Or don't be an actor. That's for sure. I mean, or don't be a director. Anything that's super artistic or super business related to the indie film business, you got to make. You got to be able to deal with rejection, lots of it, and you got to know how to not take it personally. It's part of the. It's part of the whole process and the, the business. You got to if if you. Don't have to deal with it. You got lucky. Chances are you're going to deal with it all the time. So it's an anomaly not to deal with it. The norm is to be dealing with lots of rejection. Okay, intimidation. That's a personal thing. You know, it depends how confident you are, and the person on the other side. I mean, sometimes they'll have position over you. Like for instance, you know, if you're if you're sitting in a Netflix meeting, and they have the ability to change your life. And think about it. They green light your movie. Sure. It changes your life. Yeah. Changes the whole trajectory of your life. And they don't green light it. It changes it in a different trajectory. It doesn't end your life. It just you know slows it down a little bit or something. Um, that can be intimidating. That's also the nature, the nature of the beast. Um, you know, unfortunately, and uh, you just got to know that um, you. I I relate it to poker. You got a hand. You got to play it the way you think is the best way to play it, and whatever the results are, that's the results. And you know you can't kick yourself. You don't want to kick yourself for playing your hand wrong. Um, you want to make sure after the game's over that you feel good about how you played, but you don't always win. And you got to remember that that you're just not always going to win. But you got to control your tells, scratching of the nose, getting worried, because maybe that affects the deal. If they realize how easily you can be pushed around, um, yeah, it's funny. Like, I guess I'm not very easily intimidated, so it's hard for me to relate to what you're talking about. I mean, perhaps maybe I, because I sat on the other side of the intimidation equation for so long, I sure. maybe I intimidate more than I get intimidated. I mean, it, it's almost a game for me to be. The intimidation thing is almost a bit of a game. It is a game, sort of, for me. But I understand that it's not for everybody else, and people get very nervous, and they're in environments that they're not comfortable with, especially in those distribution environments um, that can change your life. So, yeah, I mean, I wish I was more of a psychologist to be able to deal with that, but you know, I, I don't know that that is really a behavioral psychologist question, <laughs> how to deal with that personally. What filmmaking mistake has cost you the most money? To think about that. <laughs> um, the money, it's funny how you ask that question. You see, when you ask that question, it, it, I, it, right away my mind jumps to what production things have cost me the most in terms of extra costs that I've incurred. But the real question is, what opportunity cost have I lost in terms of selling or positioning a movie? That's the bigger, bigger cost, lost opportunity. So, in terms of production, you're always going to make some mistakes. You know, it's just human nature. You can't get everything perfect. I mean, experience helps not to make those mistakes. But uh, and then there's situations that you can't control: weather, equipment failure, stuff like that. So you got to be able to juggle that and deal with it. And you know, sometimes afterwards you say, "Oh, I should have done this, or I should have done that, or something like that, or or I missed this." That's life. You plan as much as you can. You hope to deal with everything. So you try to avoid those costly errors. And I'd say, you know, luckily for the most part, I have. But you know, you can't be perfect. You can't uh, you can't bat a hundred in this game. The opportunity cost lost is, you know, deals that uh, it's funny. We just talked about intimidation and 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 the whole poker game and everything like that. And I've said lots about um, you know how to push a distributor and maybe sometimes I probably have pushed a little too much, and I've maybe left some business on the table. Because I don't like to get pushed around, so maybe I push back a bit more than I should. One could say, you know, if I, I'd have to do an inventory and say, you know, maybe I lost this deal and I shouldn't have, but I got this deal and it was better than it would have been. Maybe it all netted out. Frankly, I haven't spent much time regretting. I don't tend to do that. I'm not that kind of person. I I, I tend to look forward and not backwards. You learn from your mistakes and you you keep them in the past. You try to remember what you learned and you move forward. So I, I don't I don't spend a lot of time. It's hard for me to even to remember 
some of the mistakes I made, and I'm sure I made lots of them. Yeah, it would be almost impossible to measure a missed, the cost of a missed opportunity. Uh, sometimes you can. <laughs> sometimes there's a, look at, this is like negotiating a house, right? You really, really, really want the house. Okay, let's say you're the seller, forget the buyer. You're the seller and you really want to sell your house, but you want a price. You want a million dollars for your house. A buyer comes in at 950. You go, you're at 1 1. You go down to, you know, 1.050. They move up to 960. At what point, and then, you know, then you stick to, you know, 1 million, so that's my price. They're at, they go to 970. You take it or don't you take it? You said, I want that, I want that million dollars. Now, you might not take it because you think the next person is going to pay you the million or going to pay you, you know, that's $30,000 that you might be leaving on the table. And in the grand scheme, it's 3% of the purchase, but it's still $30,000, right? And you truly believe you're going to get a million dollars. Do you walk away from it? If you walk away and you don't get another buyer, you could regret that the rest of your life. If you take the deal, you could also regret it because you'll always second guess whether you could have had that extra 30000 so it depends on the type of person you are and how you deal with those kind of things. I tend to say, I'm going to do this. Here's my deal. Here's, here's what I want to do. And then I put it behind me. I don't torment myself for going forward. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. But then, you know, you take the 970 and the next day the agent says, oh my God, you can't believe this. We just got an offer for 1.2, but, but it's too late. We already signed the other one. Did you kick yourself? circumstances, life, you got to go on, you got to move on. You can't do that to yourself. Or the market crashes. Or the market crashes. And then and, you go, I did the right thing. You did the right thing. So, you know, hindsight's 20. This is the Monday morning quarterback. You know, it's real easy to, to do it in hindsight. When does a distributor start paying a filmmaker and how often can a filmmaker expect payment? So t on a typical distribution deal, um, the first two years, the filmmaker will get reported to quarterly. So every, every three months, right? That's generally what happens. And then thereafter, it's usually every six months for the next two years and then once a year for the going forward. So generally the way they do it is um, they report the first quarter and then they, the payment, that if you're owed any money from the first quarter, it gets paid at the end of the second quarter. So it's usually shifted one quarter later. So if the first quarter is say 90 days, you'll get paid in a, at the end of the second quarter 180 days from the first quarter payment. That's generally how it's done. And you just, you know, I mean, you can ask for it before, but they generally won't do that. It, it's very standard practice to do it that way. What's the typical length of a licensing deal? Well, there's a, a distribution deal. I mean, distributors now are asking for crazy long deals. I mean, I, I like three-year deals. Distributors who are listening to this would laugh and say, yeah, you're kidding. So I'd say five to seven years is a typical deal. Distributors are asking for 15 years, some of them. I, I shake my head and roll my eyes and say, you're kidding. Like, and, but filmmakers do it because they don't know any better. So they'll, they'll do that. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to do more than five years unless there is a, like I say, a, a threshold, performance thresholds built in. Um, sometimes I'll do, say, three years with auto renewals based on hitting certain performance thresholds. So if they hit this certain level, then it automatically renews for another three years. That's a fair deal also because they're hitting targets and you want to continue to do business with them. Um, so, But uh, you don't want long, long terms that tie your film up forever, especially with no outs based on performance. What happens when a distributor goes out of business? It's tricky. It's like when any business goes out of business. You become a creditor and you stand in line with all the other creditors and uh, it's messy. Really, really messy. It's like any, you know, receivership situation or worse because sometimes they don't even go into receivership. They just disappear and you can't even find them. So it's, that's why you kind of want to deal with reputable companies if you can and hopefully they have enough business acumen and wherewithal and staying power that, you know, even if they do run into trouble, they can get through it. I but, see. you know, when a small company goes out of business, there's nothing left and there's nobody to even sue for anything. 
And by the way, if you're going to do a lawsuit, it'll cost you more than what you're probably going to collect. Sure. So if if the, if it goes into some kind of a bankruptcy proceeding, then you can apply to be one of the creditors. Yeah. Well, you automatically are a creditor. I mean, if you're you know if you have a distribution contract, okay. You, I mean, you have to. Yeah, they'll contact you. You'll fill out the paperwork, and you know you'll say that you want to. It's it's a typical receivership situation. Okay, but for those who've never been in that situation, then if you're if 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 a company goes into bankruptcy and your name is in their books and they have a contract with you, you would automatically be on the court paperwork. And, okay. Well, here's the key. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned this. The, the key thing with the with the receivership a, a bankruptcy situation or receivership is. Getting your money is going to be almost, if there's money owing to you, it's going to be almost impossible to get it. It's, it's super, super, super tricky to get through that. and It's super messy. Make sure you get your rights back. The key is that you've got to make sure that the contract, there's a, generally all distribution contracts have a termination um, clause for, that would be considered a, a substantial or a, um, I forget the word, a breach. You know, like a, um, I forget the legal term, a big breach. And um, so a major breach. So therefore, it would automatically terminate the contract, the, the deal, and your rights would come back. But you m- need to make sure that you that you paper that, that you document it, that that you've the contract's been terminated and you have the rights. Because otherwise, those rights could sit in receivership forever oh, wow. and be and what we call chain of title could get muddied. And therefore, you won't be able to sell it to anybody else because you want to have a clean chain of title. I hadn't even thought of that. Oh, so just, su- that's the wow. most important thing. So even if a company is defunct, it doesn't mean that your rights have been terminated as, as well as any payments to you. And it's got to be well documented. I mean, it, it should mean that, but it might go into some holding pattern or something. Right. Like I'm not a bankruptcy ex- expert. Sure, sure. But sometimes these things take years and years and years to resolve and you get tied up with it. So you need to clean that up right away before you clean up the money situation. So then you would have trouble going to a new distributor because you don't have a clean chain of title. That's correct. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, because they'll see that, you know, potentially there's somebody else. The receivers, you know, might have the chain of title. I mean, somebody else might, or somebody might buy that company out of receivership because they want those contracts. Wow, but that happens actually. That's that's mm. very common. Mm. I mean, there's value to those distribution contracts because there's revenue streams coming in. So if somebody can pick up the entire company and the whole library, you know, ten cents on the dollar, that's a really good deal, and you kind of get screwed. Ah, so if it, if someone came in, but took over their inventory, it, are the are your contract is your contract going to be? Those those same rights will revert to the new company, or unless no? they oh. unless they're automatically terminated, or you have provided for termination, or you you know, or you claim a breach. Right. I would say in, that it would be better if you want to deal with the new company in the case of where the a receivership is, you know, selling to a new buyer, um, terminate with the old company and, and contract with the new company as opposed to having them buy it out. But you have to make sure you have that term in your contract, right? Like, that it's and that's pretty standard. That's one of those boilerplate terms. But make sure it's in there. Your two thousand four film, My Brother's Keeper. Do you still have the same distributor that you did at two thousand four? Technically, because that distributor was myself. I self distributed it. I mean, I owned a distribution company, and I still own a distribution company. So yeah, the answer would be they happen to be different companies. One was in Canada, one was in the U.S. But I still, I can, I own both of those companies. So I would answer that yes, they're the same distributor. It's me. Okay. So you haven't had to renegotiate your own contract? So for instance, I licensed that movie to many television networks. Um, and primarily they were three to four year deals when I f- first did them. So they've expired, those licenses have expired. And so, and I, and I own the movie. So now um, I've taken back those rights and I've relicensed them sometimes to the same broadcaster, but sometimes to a different broadcaster in the same territory. So like if, you know, here in the United States, not that I did this, but like, let's say you license to NBC on your first round. Um, when that expires after four years, you can go and license it to ABC. Now, nobody licenses NBC or ABC except for their, like, no, I just use that as an example, okay? But so, so I've since licensed out a second round. Um, in that case, there's actually a third round. Um, 
the only long-term contract, and they, these have all expired. Like I had a DVD, back then I was doing DVDs, right? So there was a long-term, I think it was a seven-year DVD distribution deal, which obviously expired also. Um, with a, so I don't do I didn't do physical DVD distribution in my company. I did it when I worked for other people, so I know how it works. But I didn't want to be in manufacturing all that kind of stuff. So I did a long term deal with them. They put it out to the marketplace. It's since expired, so I could read up that with them or somebody else. But there aren't really any DVD sales anymore. So you know those rights are sitting idle. And there are some international deals that. So basically, I have taken back all the rights on that film from what I licensed the first time around. I made some other deals a fraction of what I did the first time around because like I said, most of the good deals are done in the first round. Once a film gets, especially an indie film, it's if it's a classic, you know, if I had It's a Wonderful Life, I'd license it over and over. Well, that's public domain, but something, you know, Shawshank Redemption, you license it over and over and over and over and it actually gains value probably. Um, you know, Forrest Gump, all the classics, right? But not indie films. Indie films tend to lose momentum after a while. So the second and third round of licensing, like, you know, say they're four to five year periods, tend to get less robust, much less. So you're lucky if you get anything, you know, after the first round. Unless, let's suppose the original licensing had a star in it who wasn't very well known, and then maybe a decade later becomes A-list talent. Yeah, that's like finding a lottery ticket in your drawer that hasn't expired yet. Um, it's just a thought. It's, no, no, it's great. It, no, and, and it does happen. Okay. It does happen and people do it all the time. They say, hey, let's re-release this movie because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Tom Hanks was a child when we made it and now he's a superstar. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it happens for sure. When a licensing deal expires, what happens? They send you paperwork to renew? No, or how does no, no. this work? You track it. So um, if you're a distributor or you're dealing with a distributor, you have extensive uh, records. So you have a database. It's generally on a spreadsheet. So and it, it, think of it this. You have all the rights and all the territories. So you say, and all the periods. So, um, so you say, okay, here's this film. I'm, you know, it's Italy, Spain, France, Germany, you know, UK, and I license it to, you know, this broadcaster in France for this period of time. And it goes on to a spreadsheet so that you can monitor when it expires. So the, the, that's what all distributors have. They have these, these huge extensive databases of all the films that they have and all the rights that they've licensed for what periods of time to which contact. And, and they, it gets triggered now. It's all computerized. It gets triggered and says, okay, this is expiring. Now it's available for relicensing or doing it somewhere else. And it's very important to keep track of all that because you don't want to do, you know, two deals. And you can't, it would be illegal to license, you know, the same rights to two people. So you have to keep really good records of that. And distributors do that. I mean, that's, they all have these very, you know, robust, fancy databases that keep track of that. I do it on a spreadsheet. I don't have that many films, so you know the ones I self-distribute, I'm able to keep track of all those deals. So you're not only having them keep track of it, but you have your own records. Well, for the most part, I don't deal with distributors. I am the distributor. Sure. So if and when I do deal with a distributor, yeah, I, I keep my own records because I'm super diligent that way because I care about all that stuff. I want to know when the deals are expiring because you know sometimes they, I shouldn't use this, conveniently forget to tell you conveniently, but sometimes they just generally, you know, it's honestly forget to tell you. So I will say to a distributor, you know, according to my records, this deal has now expired, you know, is and, and the, the license is over and I'm taking the rights back. We're not renewing. Right. And there's no thing like an auto renew, you know, how those, Oh yeah, there are. Oh, there are. Oh, okay. yeah, you can write that into a contract. Okay. You can say, you know, it'll, yeah, you can do auto renews if you want. I, I tend to not do them because there's no reason to because I'd rather renegotiate something. Uh, but some people do them. Sure, sure. And I'm thinking from the perspective of, of an independent filmmaker who's not a distributor, you know, how should they keep records and not just wait to get something in the mail or not get something yeah, in the they're, mail? Yeah, they're probably not going to keep records because they don't like to do that. They don't want to be involved in that and it's not artistic and it's not what they do. So, you know, but uh, it's not that hard to do. Right. And, and just, once you have a couple painful lessons, then you go, yeah, I'm going to start keeping records. Or, or find somebody who can keep it for you. I don't know, an accountant, something, I don't know, somebody who doesn't mind doing that kind of thing. It's not hard to do. 
it's one entry every four to five years. Wow. And you just have to have a trigger point to, you know what I mean, you have to look at it, you know, maybe once a month and see what's coming up and just remind yourself. Is it a good idea for a filmmaker to pitch a distributor their idea before they pitch an investor their idea? Excellent idea. It's the best idea. I'll tell you why. Because if they can get a distributor interested, it'll make the pitch to the investor so much easier. Because a smart investor, they're going to ask, the first question they're going to ask is not what's the movie about. Frankly, they don't care. They're going to ask how you're going to sell it and how much you're going to make with it. That's what investors care about. They, it's called return on investment ROI. All right, so if the answer to that question is funny, you should ask that because I actually have a distribution deal and I've got sales forecasts here and this is what we think we're going to make from it from this legitimate distributor who's been in this business for 25 years and knows what they're doing. That is a super compelling pitch to an investor. Way better than, oh, we're going to find that out and I'll let you know. Here's my guess. It's the way to do it. And so a prospective indie filmmaker will do what? They'll find a list of distributors in their niche, they'll email, very brief email saying, here's my idea. I mean, how, how do you do, how do you pitch someone before you even have the film made yeah, yeah, or even yeah. investors? This gets tricky. This is called put on your dancing shoes and, and uh, or some people call it burning the candle at both ends where basically you're going to tell your distributor, your potential distributor, what you sort of already have and you're going to tell your investor what this distributor sort of is going to tell you. You're, I don't, it's, it's not, you, you, this is salesmanship, all right? This is, this is the art of pitching and, and developing and selling, all right? So you're an investor and you want to hear that a distributor is already interested because when you hear that, you'll be more interested. But now you're a, distri you're, you're a distributor you don't really care about the guy's investor. What you care about is, did you make the movie yet? So basically what you want to hear that you're going to make a really good movie and this could be something. So you almost have to say to the distributor, in some ways you just have to fess up and you have to say, look, I haven't made the movie yet, but I'm going to make this kick-ass great movie. It's going to be fantastic. And you don't have to go into a lot more detail unless they ask you about that. Um, I think you'd be the right distributor for it. I'm not asking you for any guarantees right now. All I'm asking you for is to ex show me in writing, express some interest that I've spoken to you and that this is, could be something that we you would be interested in after you make it that might be you know, valuable. And if, and if it's as good as you say it's going to be, it could generate $2 million in sales. No commitments. Very airy-fairy language. Very, very light. It's not any type of legal document that you could ever... <laughs> finance or, or rely on or anything, but it's better than not having it. At least it's you, the investor sees you made the effort to go to the distributor to have the conversation, to at least get into the ballpark, to at least get an understanding, and they'll feel more confident with that. So theoretically, you have two phones and you're running back and forth. Not theoretically, for real. For real, okay. Yeah, for real. That's what you're doing. And you're, you're, I call it the dance. You're sure. doing the dance and you're dancing at two parties at the same time and hoping that you don't fall over. But that's what everybody does. I mean, that's how, it's not just the film business. That's how a lot of projects, I mean, biotech, you know, um, you know, uh, high tech, all this, a lot of stuff gets financed that way because you got nothing, right? You got an idea. Unless you have a track record, you know, then who are you? You got a guy with an idea or a girl with an idea who just, you know, has a vision. People can't buy into that. So you have to start really slowly and get make tiny little steps both ways until you can, that's why I say burn the candle. You got to just bring it closer and closer and closer until boom, you got it. Jeff, is this how you've approached your previous film? Yeah, I'd say I'm a pretty good tap dancer. My wife would tell you that I'm not a good dancer at all, but uh, she hasn't seen me in business. She just sees me on the real dance floor. Uh, no, I, I know how to do the dance. Um, it's, it's, look at, first of all, I would say I'm, and I think anybody who's dealt with me would say I'm a pretty honest person. Um, so if somebody says, hey, you know, where are you at with this? Have you made it? I'd say, no, I haven't made it. It's an idea. But until they ask me that, it's going to feel like it's not an idea. It's going to feel like it's way more developed because you, I, you need to hold people's hand through the process. People who are very seasoned and know all about it, they're a walk in the park. But a lot of people aren't seasoned. So you just have to need to hold their hand and get them over the hump. 
get them to share the vision. And, and, and it really involves a lot of finessing and, and timing and, you know, don't push too hard here, don't push, too, but you got to push a little, like I say, you got to make little steps each way to get up to the thing so that, boom, you can get what you want done to bring, you know, kind of two elements together, financing and distribution, which are closely related. The revenue stream and the cash flow, those are very closely related concepts and, and you know, sometimes it takes a lot of juggling and I think a lot of indie filmmakers fail at that. I mean, it's very, very difficult to do that. It's, it's a bit of an art and there are people who are really, really good at it as you've seen and, uh, you know, that's what investment bankers do, frankly, and that's what venture capitalists do. They just bring ideas to life by bringing parties together, bringing money together with, with sales. Why do you think a lot of independent filmmakers fail at it? Because they're too anxious. They're way, way, way too anxious and they jump the gun a little bit. Now, first of all, they don't know distribution well enough, so they don't put enough weight on the sales side and the revenue generation side. Um, they put most of it on the artistic side. So when they're, for the most part, when they're pitching an investor, they're telling them how good the movie's going to be and how good it's going to look and it's going to be fantastic and we'll be able to sell it. Um, I never start that way with investors. I always say, here's what the marketplace will bear. Here's what we think we're going to do. We're going to generate a million and a half dollars on a million dollar budget or on an $800,000 budget. The ROI is going to be this. Oh, and by the way, here's the movie. I've never had an investor ask me to read a script. I mean, I'd give them a log line. They don't care. Why should they care? They're investing in you, your ability to make a film and your ability to sell the film. That's what they're investing in. Now, the bells and whistles and the fun stuff for an investor are, hey, can I come on set? Can I do a cameo? Can I read the script? Can my kid be in the movie? You know, that, that's the bells and whistles and that's the icing on the cake and you throw all that in because, you know, you want to do some, the deal and make it fun for everybody. But the core essence of the investment is, are you going to be able to deliver the, the really good film that you said you can and are you going to be able to sell it? And how do I know you can sell it? How do I know you can make it? Hopefully you've made some other stuff or you surround yourself by good filmmakers or whatever. That's the credibility thing. Um, how do I know you're going to sell it? You're dealing with people who have sold before. You have surrounded yourself in those circles. And, you know, although we know it's a risk, it's not sold, it's not pre-sold, we know there's a risk there, but at least you're thinking about it and you're planning for it. That's a good thing, which is what most indie filmmakers don't do because they don't like to do that. Out of the seven feature films that you've made, Jeff, how many times have you gone to the distributor first before you've gone to the investor? Every time. I, I, I wouldn't go to an investor until I have a distribution plan. There's no point in pitching an investor unless you have a complete plan of how you're going to generate revenue because that's the number one question that they, that they ask you and that's what you have to lead with. It's an investment. Now, but remember, this is a business for me, right? So if it's a business for me, it's an, a business for my investors. I've never gone to Uncle Charlie and said, you know what, Uncle Charlie, I'm dying to make a film and I need somebody to pay for it and don't expect to get any money. I need a donation. I've never done that because that's not what, who I am and what I do. I've always gone to people and said, Uncle Charlie, um, what are you investing in? Real estate? You know, what are you making? You're making 8% on your money? I'll show you a place that you can make 15%. I got a film and here's the cash flow on it and here's my revenue projections. And the reason you should believe this is because I've distributed 50 other films like this. Here's what the marketplace looks like. And you know, you can make some serious money on this. And here's the time frame it's going to take and here's how the cash flow works and all this kind of stuff. And he says, oh, that's interesting. What's the film? Most filmmakers say, oh, I've got this great film. It's a, it's a rom-com and it's going to be great and it's going to start this and here's the story and here's the plot lines and here's the beats and here's this and all that kind of stuff. And they never get to the ROI and the revenue because you're an investor, you're putting money in. Now remember, if, if you're looking for the donation, do it differently. If you're looking for an investor, who actually wants to make a return on investment, you got to show them the investment. You got to lead with the money. So I would never even bother pitching an investor until I have totally mapped out the distribution and revenue generation plan. And you know, for the most part, I self-distribute. So I, I'm able to do that myself. Um, but there are cases recently, you know, where, where I've worked on other people's films where I have mapped out their entire revenue generation plan 
long before they've even tapped into an investor. And by the way, there was a case, one of my clients, and I won't name them, but if they're watching, they know who they are. They came to me and they said, um, I've been pitching my potential investor group and they're not biting, can you help me? And I said, what's your pitch? And they showed it to me and I said, you're just talking about the film. If I was an investor, what, I, would, I would have no interest in investing because you're asking for a donation here so that you can you know, make a film. Let's rejig it. And I said, I, I'll pitch for you, but you can't be there because you're gonna spend too much time talking about the movie. And you're gonna be aggravated that all I talk about is the investment. So I went and pitched all of his investor group, including <laughs> all of his relatives, like we're talking, you know, parents, all this kind of stuff, you know, and and um, and just talked about the money, and then it, and they said, okay, now it's an investment. Before it was a donation, now it's an investment. Thank you very much. This makes sense. You sure you can do it? And I said, yeah. And I charged them a pretty big fee to do it, and uh, and I also arranged all this distribution for him too, which I also charged a fee for. But because of that, not only did he get his financing, but he actually made the movie and he actually sold the movie. So it all worked out. People got you know what they bargained for, and uh, I was pretty confident that I could sell that movie. And I actually said, you know, in some ways I kind of pre-sold it. The only reason I didn't pre-sell is because I wasn't making it. So I had to make sure that he was going to make the movie, that he could deliver the movie that I was negotiating for. But my credibility is at stake too. So I wasn't, you know, it, it was his movie, not mine. I didn't have creative control over it. So. I was prepared to go a certain distance, but if he didn't deliver a good movie, I didn't want to take a distributor's money for a movie that wasn't good. Because I have, you know, I have pride and credibility too at stake. What's the time frame of getting investors versus getting distributors? I do it simultaneously. You do it at the same time because they more or less take the same amount of time, um, and they're, it's not a linear thing. It, it, it's it's a parallel situation. So basically as I'm pitching distributors, I'm also lining up investors and pitching them, but I'm, I've done the work that the distributor is going to do for me already. I've already done all the revenue forecasts and all I need them to do is sign off on them. So I'm already pitching the investors saying that this is who it's going to be or this is what the numbers are going to look like. And they say, who's the distributor? If I pitch early before I have a distributor, then I'll say, well, I'm talking to these three and I'm in negotiations right now, but we're all in the same area. This is sort of the numbers and I'll line that up afterwards, but at least I have three on the table. And I might not, I might have five, I might have two, but you know, you just, it's part of the, the I shouldn't call it the dance. It's, it's part of the process. You know, it's, it's a real part and, and um, you know you're gonna get one. Like I know I'm gonna get one of the three, um, and I might get a bidding war, and it might be better than what, what I had pitched to them. But um, they both need to hear, like the distributor also doesn't want to gauge, get engaged until they know that you have financing to make your movie. So when you say, hey, guess what? I'm, you know, I have an investor meeting tonight. I got you know, six investors coming to my house, and I'm pitching them, and if you give me this document, there's a good chance I can green light it, and if I green light it, you're gonna get to distribute it. So there's incentive on that side also. Where are you getting the information for these forecasts? Well, again, I get it because I've been in distribution my whole life. So I, I, I forecast it myself based on my own experience and everything. You know what the key thing is? I, this is what I, I've said this, and I don't know if this is even possible, but it would be a perfect world if coming out of film school, all young indie filmmakers got hooked up with a mentor an experienced mentor. That would be the way to launch people's careers. Because all the stuff that we're talking about really comes with experience. The, all the credibility comes with experience. You have to have made the mistakes. So, um, but it takes years and years and years to get there, to make the mistakes. So it would be more of a launch pad if an indie filmmaker could come out of film school, have their hand held by, you know, this happens in like, think of what doctors do. Doctors go for four year, um, you know, residencies. Four years they get their hands held. So that, you know, because they, they, you know, medicine doesn't want to put somebody in the field until they're super, super confident that they've already learned all this stuff, right? What if we did that in filmmaking? Like, hooked these young filmmakers up with experienced filmmakers and had the experienced filmmakers help navigate all these challenges, getting a distributor, you know, pitching to investors, 
um, you know, maybe even helping them develop or, or, you know, teaching them how to properly make their films on time and on budget. This would be super helpful for indie filmmakers who it's very difficult to navigate that. One, you don't know what you're doing. Two, you're not credible even if you did know what you're doing. Nobody's going to believe you know what you're doing because you've never done it before. I mean, there's just these big hurdles that, you know, that you have to overcome that really come with time. And so if you had somebody by your side, like, you know, experienced doctor holding the hand of a resident and making sure they don't make a mistake, but letting them learn on their own, you know, or letting them make a mistake even and then correcting it afterwards, that could be super helpful. So I don't know how that could work, but that that's really what sh would be great for indie film. They, they, they need to... They need to hook themselves up with if they want to get a like a high budget feature made. Like I'm going to say a high budget, you know, anything like above a half a million dollars, which isn't a hobby film, which is a real movie, which is you know potentially distributable and can get onto you know a streaming service. They got to almost be connected with a with an experienced filmmaker so that they'll be taken seriously. They could be a better filmmaker than that experienced filmmaker, maybe more talented, but the experienced filmmaker has. The credibility from years of doing it and knows how to say the right things to the right people in the right tone and just can help them over those hurdles. Otherwise, you know, you could stumble and fall for a long, long time, wait in a lot of lines, you know, never get those distribution meetings, you know, never really land a, a, a true investor. It, it's, it's tricky to juggle it all. Do you think in some ways, though, hand holding prevents? It makes it too easy for people. Sometimes it's prevents good to learning. have people. It prevents learning and it also doesn't build resiliency. I see a lot of people that have had their hands held. They're not resilient and, yeah. they, and they almost need some of these hard knocks. I think there could be a nice combination of the two. I think there comes a time when you've learned the lesson, you've, you've fallen, you've been gotten up by yourself a couple of times and you can just use a, a little bit of a helping hand. There, there's a balance. There is a balance. Yeah, because I don't think that the real world, there's not a lot of helping hands. And I'm not saying that it's totally... So why, why don't we let doctors struggle through it? Well, that's a little different. Why? Because they're saving lives. Well, they're they're opening up someone's aorta. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, you fair know, I don't, I, I don't know fine. if I want... But, but Plumbers have like five-year residences sure, or something. That, I mean, you that's can really mess things crazy, up. Yeah. yeah, they can mess things up. Okay, so a filmmaker can't totally mess things up, but, you know, they... Well... Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Fair, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not important, and, and you could say the same for entrepreneurs as well and, and, and other businesses, but sometimes I think too much hand-holding spoils people, and then they don't learn the right lessons. I, I totally agree. The School of Hard Knocks is the best teacher. I totally agree with you. Yeah. But at some point, you've been knocked so many times, and it's just you just have to get over a hurdle. And once you, you, you've already, you appreciate it. You appreciate yeah. that you, you can't get over that hurdle without some mentoring. And then you get over it and you get knocked around a little bit more. There, there, there's a balance. Yeah, I'm sure there is. It's, it's, that's what goes on in parenting. You just got to find that right balance of how much to protect your child and how much to let them, you know, fall and stumble and get back up. Yeah, because in business, there's, there's not a lot of, of heart and hand-holding from the other side, correct? Okay, but only in the indie world. In, in, the, in the studio world, everybody gets their hand held. Everybody's protected. Everybody's got these big crews and all these protection mechanisms around them and nobody really can fail by themselves. So they, they're in this very comfortable environment. You have to really mess up to, on a, you know, in a big film crew or whatever. Um, but getting in that world is really tricky, right? That's true. That's but, you know, you're talking about the entrepreneurial world where, you know, you're out there alone and you, I don't know. I agree with you. But there maybe could be more of a balance. I mean, it, what would be so terrible after somebody stumbled and fallen a few times and says, hey, you know, I just can't get over this hurdle, just to help them over it and let them get on to the next thing. And hopefully they'll remember that, that they stumbled and fell and got some help. And maybe, you know, yeah. let's pass it forward, play it, you know, pay Yeah, it that would be nice. Jeff, a lot of filmmakers complain about getting, well, for lack of a better word, I guess, screwed by distributors with hidden costs and different things. Can you talk about how this happens and what filmmakers should look out for? Yeah, that's nah, it's it's very real. I mean, a, a lot of filmmakers, the right word is screwed. Um, it's they, all of a sudden, um, you get a statement and you owe them money because they've spent so much money on marketing and this kind of stuff. And you think like, where did that go? So listen, 
A lot of it's real. I spoke about marketing and how important it is and you should tuck away a lot of money to market. So the distributor is marketing for you. Hopefully they're spending lots of money on your behalf to market your film to get it out there. You want them to do that. Um, the only problem is sometimes they will spend in areas that benefit them and not you. I'll give you a great example, okay? Film markets. So they attend, most distributors attend, you know, at least five or six major film markets a year and it's expensive. Really, like I don't know if you've ever been to Cannes or, or Berlin or it's, you go there, hotel rooms are fortunate, especially they jack them up during those festivals and you know, those markets. Um, they have to fly, you know, and they fly first class sometimes and, and they eat fancy meals and entertain a lot of people with expensive bottles of wine and this kind of thing. Now, that's good because hopefully they're making sales. But if they're not making sales, that cost is coming right back to you and you're paying for that. And they, they disseminate that cost through all the films that they represent. And now the thing is, you know, a lot of them charge a flat fee for markets plus, so it's general market attendance fee plus direct expenses related. So here would be, so let's say you get charged, I don't know, $10,000 for them. On your film gets charged $10,000 for them to attend can, but then they take somebody out for dinner and, and basically talk about your film supposedly only your film um, and that dinner costs you know six hundred dollars that comes you get charged back um, if they talked about five films hopefully all of them got but sometimes they charge the full six hundred dollars to all five films that's that's the, 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 when people talk about getting screwed they don't even know how badly they're getting screwed like that's stuff that's not even auditable you can never you what are you going to relive that dinner you're going to say hey like, and they don't, they don't even tabulate it that way. It's not like they say, oh, here's a dinner in can between this person and this person and him, which <laughs> it's not like a lawyer who gives you a log, right? Um, they say can, you know, market expense and um, ancillary expenses for your film only, you know, another $4,500. You say, what was that? Well, we had to entertain people. We had to do this. You never know. And you never know if they charge every single film that. So chances are they're making more money off of that than they are off of selling your films. That's the screwing that people talk about. And it's very real. It happens a lot on a regular basis because it's so easy to do. It's so easy to get away with it. It's almost unauditable. Um, that's the trust factor. So how do you prevent it? You put a cap on your expenses. You say to the, in the contract, you say, um, you, you can't spend more than, you know, say 5% of the revenue that you're generating unless you get sign off from me. So if you want to do an additional expense, say an, run an ad, you know, do another market, do this, that, then I have to sign off and give approval. And distributors don't like that because they don't like to be accountable and sign off, but that's how you prevent it. It's one of the only ways to prevent it. And it's, it's a pretty common thing to do. I do. I mean, it's, I wouldn't do a distribution deal without that because expenses can run wild. But it's not in the boilerplate that they give. No, of course not. So, okay. So. No, no, it's in the boilerplate that I give. <laughs> okay. yeah, remember, I have, I have the boilerplate. I have the, I have in my files the, the independent producer boilerplate contract that they should use for distribution. And the distributors have the distributor boilerplate contract that they would use. And there's some major differences. Sure. All the all the terms are the same, but the way they're skewed, you know, mine tend to skew more in favor of the producer. Right. You know, and then you, you come to, but th that's that's the classic screwing. And the, there, there's, there's another classic. There's there's two other ones actually. Oh please. Oh, yeah. Second one is reporting of revenues. Like, how would you ever know if a deal got done that didn't get reported? Let's say they sell your movie to a, uh, you know, a cable station in Greece. I mean, you don't even know the cable stations in Greece, let alone how much they sold it for and if the contract ever got negotiated or done or whatever. So unreported revenue sometimes happens and, you know, distributors who watch this are going to say, no, we never do that, but they do. They do. It happens, unfortunately. And then there is what we call, the term is called cross collateralization. And it is where you're taking either a pool of films or you're taking a pool of rights. This is where it gets, this is where it gets, <laughs> this is a concept that will make indie filmmakers heads spin. 
it's not even complicated, but it's just a, so let's say you say to the, your distributor, we want you to sell, say, there's two ways it happens. Three of our films, or we want you to sell one of our films in 15 different territories. So let's say that in the UK, film number one, they make a great deal on it, right? But in the USSR, film number two, they make a terrible deal, but they spent a lot of money in, you know, in traveling there or whatever. So they take the, pr the revenue of one deal and cross it over with the costs of another deal. So the costs neutralize the revenue, meaning you get nothing and they get their costs paid by your revenue. So they're taking a pool. Now they can do that with shared rights, shared films, or sometimes they'll do it with a whole pool of films that you don't even own. It could be just a whole collection of other films and they'll cross everything over and, and neutralize it all so that they make a bigger fee and you get stuck with all the costs because they don't want to get stuck with the costs. They want all those costs disseminated through, through the, the system. And this is where it gets messy. Now, I have audited distributors before, like major distributors. Generally, I, it's almost a waste of time to audit the small guys. The public companies, those are the ones you audit. And it's messy. I mean, there are all kinds of things that, <laughs> that I, I could tell you. Is, I, I, I'll tell you one story. So I had a film. I, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, I put it out. I, this one I used through a distributor um, for certain territories. I was self-distributing the film for, for major territories, but there are other territories that I don't deal with because they're, they're too complicated, language issues, cultural issues. I mean, I just don't have the wherewithal to deal with everything. So I gave it to a distributor. They did some decent deals. I knew they did the deals because I was able on, by the internet, you can go on and see where they're playing and what the schedule is. So you can, fact, you can verify this stuff, you know? You can also phone the, dis the broadcasters and say, okay, when's it playing? What's going on? Blah, 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 da, 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 da. So I knew the deals had been done. And they also had done some VOD, um, you know, digital deals. And I saw that it was trending really well. There's some trending reports that you can look at. You can't get the sales, but you can see the trending. All right, so I, I had a pretty good idea that there were lots of sales. I get the first report back and it's zero, zero revenue. And I say, guys, this is impossible. I know for a fact that you sold Australia. How do you know? Because I spoke to the Australian um, broadcaster and they told me they have your movie. I'm friends with them. I know for a fact, it's impossible that you don't have revenue. Let me, let's check. They check the system. Oh, you're right, you know what? This deal got, um, it's called mapping. It got mapped into a different revenue stream. It went to another. I said, you guys are a public company. You can't, I mean, mapping errors? Okay, fine. I said, there's more. There, th th that's not enough. There's so much more going on. They said, no, there isn't, Jeff. I said, fine, I'm gonna audit you. I audited them. You have to spend money. You have to get an auditor. You make appointments, public company. It's a big deal to do an audit, very expensive. But, you know, Anyway, I found $200,000 in missing revenue on the first audit. The first audit, they and they danced around, well, sorry, this, that, mistake here, mistake there. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of missing money. It's only a certain territory, right? So, um, so then I said, okay, fine. Um, I'm going to do, a, so then another three quarters passed and I said, I'm going to do another audit to end the year. I go in, I find another $50,000. So I say, I believe that there's still some missing revenue here and here's why I believe it. And I took them to arbitration because in my contract, I couldn't sue them. I'd had to, it was built in that it was going to be arbitrated. Cost me a lot of money to arbitrate. They spent a ton of money on a big fancy lawyer and it went to an arbitrator and it took six months and I thought it was going to be a slam dunk, but they out lawyered me and I'm a lawyer. And they out and I learned a really good lesson about, about legal proceedings. And it's got nothing to do with film reporting or film distribution. It's all about legal manipulation and how to game the system. And they're a big public company and they out lawyered me. And I know that I left a lot of money on the table, not to mention how much I spent on the arbitration. And you asked me before, you know, is there any regrets that I have? I would have dealt with that one differently, but you don't know that until after the fact. Anyways, 
how many indie film producers? And after that, I came home after that day, after the final judgment on the arbitration, I said to my wife, I'm sick to my stomach about this, but I'm way sicker about how many indie filmmakers have been screwed by this company probably for the last decade. Thousands. Thousands of films have probably lost hundreds, tens of millions of dollars have been left on the table because nobody can afford to do what I did and I lost. I lost. That's what goes on. That goes on all the time and it's a shame and it would be great if somehow, you know, the world could... I said, I'm going on a crusade. I said to my wife, this is it. I'm going on a crusade. I am going to go and I'm going to dig up everything from every public company, from every filmmaker, and I'm going to be the hero. And she said, just go to sleep. You, tomorrow morning you wake up, you'll be a calmer. <laughs> you know, That crusade would be a lifetime thing for me and it would cost $10 million in legal fees. Now, if I could put a fund together from all the filmmakers, you know, to represent them, or if the filmmakers did have representation, then, and you know, in some type of protection agency or something like that who could represent them, that would be fantastic. But they don't. Indie filmmakers don't have any associations like that. They don't have any... To go it alone is impossible. It's costly and crazy and you don't know what you're doing and it's... and it's... and it's... It, you can't do it. Maybe to go to his group, but you know, they don't, nobody's got any money. So, but tens of millions of dollars have been left on the table, hundreds of millions. I, I can't even fathom how much, just based on my own experience, how much has been screwed, how, how much indie filmmakers have, have walked away from, because they don't know. And even if they did know, it'd be hard to get it. And with the collateralization of these films with the distributor, is that similar to CDOs? That what sunk the housing market in some sense? The collateralized debt obligations? No. No, it's not the same. No, okay. No, 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 so no, it's no. it's but but so so they package these films and they sell them to these different territories. Yeah, and like, let me give you another okay. example, okay? Mm -hmm. This really, really irked me. But again, you have to be able to dig into the weeds to get this example. So another distributor I was using is also Australia happened to be. So they sold a package. So they're representing many, many, many films. Okay, I was one film in a package of probably say 25 that they sold to a, a broadcaster in, in, the, in Australia. I got the report. My number was like, I don't know, $75 for a like five-year deal, broadcast deal on one of my best films. It was like some stupid number, like literally less than $100. I phone him up and I say, what? what is this? It's a five-year deal and you sold it for $75? Well, we did a package deal. You were one of a package. So we had to prorate the numbers. I said, prorate? Like how much? I'd like to see the prorating. Sorry, we don't share that because it's other privileged information for other films. So of course I did a little digging only to find out that you know the 10 main films that were sold they owned not only did they distribute they owned them they were proprietary so what they did is they took everybody else's films pretty well gave them away for free in order to get the revenue for their films that's a very common practice and there's nothing you can do about it i mean there's lots you can do if you know about it and you can contract that kind of thing also but it's super super tricky and you had a leg up in that you had a friend. I knew. Well, so, I knew the deal was there. Right. So so most people wouldn't be privy to that information. They wouldn't know you wouldn't where even to look. Know. First of all, well, you get reported. It was on the report, you know, and there was a revenue number, $75 or some stupid number. So so at least they reported something. I'm, the other example I gave is when they don't report anything. So you never even know that a ah, deal was made. okay, right. Yeah, no, there, there's two types. There's They don't report anything, so you can never even question it because you, you never even... You don't know. What are you going to go phone every territory around the world and do research every week and say, mm -hmm. hey, I heard you sold this to that? You don't know. This is, they reported it, but it was so low. At least there's something you can question. And then it was a package deal. And there's not much you can do if you hadn't contracted against that because that's their privilege to do that. I mean, they shouldn't. It's wrong, but it happens. Is this the same type of stuff that's gone on in the music industry? I don't, music's not my, I mean, you know, I know music, um, but I'm, I, I think music's even worse. Music is, is just, 
I mean, first of all, it's an older industry and it was a bigger industry for a while. And um, it's just so easy to cheat and pirate music. And yeah, I think it's worse. Mm. It's, it's, it's a real problem with all intellectual property software, anything like that, anything that's hard to like, you know, that that's hard to, well, it's, I guess it's a problem with anything, anybody who does dishonest business, right? I mean, you could have hard products too and inventory and, you know, sometimes it disappears and it was destroyed or returns or this or that. I mean, you know, that happens all over the place. Sure. They call it shrinkage. In shrinkage. That, in, that's exactly uh, yeah. right. That's what it's called. Shrinkage. Yeah. So maybe that's what we should call it in the film industry, but, uh, there seems to be a lot of it. So that's part of, you know, hopefully knowing what you're doing and paying attention. But it's it's not easy. Sure. And now a lot of things can be blamed on computer error. Before maybe human error, but Everything's, computer error. Everything. That's, that's exactly, it was called a mapping error. <laughs> mapping means that revenues flow in and then they get disseminated to each of the films. Um, that's the map. And, and they claimed, because I was going to sue them after arbitration, but they claimed to the arbitrator that the mapping was wrong and they showed, you know, and I said, guys, it's a real problem that a public company your size has mapping errors. Can you imagine if we started digging how many mapping errors? I mean, like I'm a little tiny pebble in an ocean compared to what you guys do. I'm one little tiny independent film. Um, it's really bad that you got mapping errors and so many of them. And then I just went digging and I found that and that's like surface stuff. Yeah. So, you know, maybe I shouldn't be accusatory and say that it happened on purpose, but I am saying that. And you have to pay for an arbitrator, correct? Oh, yeah. So lot. you have to go to a list of... Hold on, not only, hold on. Mm -hmm. When you initiate arbitration, not only do you have to pay from my side, I have to pay for their side. Mm. That's the way arbitration works. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it was a pride thing. And, you know, it's just one of those stubborn, I just don't want to get taken advantage of. But the way the legal system works is even if you win, you lose. You win the battle and lose the war because, you know, even if you win the issue, it costs you twice as much to litigate it. Sure. So such is life. But the light at the end of the tunnel is that movie still was very successful and I was happy to have made it. And if I focus on the negatives, then I'll be miserable. So I try to focus on the pauses, which is what most people do. Um, but, uh, you know, it's good to at least know what you're doing. So at least you have a shot at, at, at getting it done properly. What's the difference between film markets and film festivals? Markets are generally um, not open to the public. They're for buyers. They're for industry executives only. So you're getting buyers from around the world, which are acquisition people and, you know, TV executives, that type of thing, who are looking for product to acquire. And then you have sellers, which are primarily distributors and studios and that type of thing who are selling product. And so a market would be a place where the two would converge and it wouldn't be open to the public. Um, you have to have credentials to register in one of those in a market. A festival, and the big ones are obvious. I mean, Cannes has a festival and a market at the same time. Um, so they run parallel. Um, so it's a lot of big Festivals also have markets that run parallel. Everybody thinks they're just festivals. The public thinks they're festivals, but the professionals know there's markets. Um, but there's like a lot of markets that are just markets. Like the American film market is just a market. It's not a film festival. So there's no, the public can't attend it. They can't register for it. They can't go to see any films. A film festival is designed for filmmakers to showcase their movies to the public. So the public's obviously invited and encouraged to come and watch as many independent movies as or whatever movies are showcased there. Um, and it's a chance for a, a, you know, a filmmaker to one, celebrate their movie, um, you know, cause they made this great thing and they want to, and two, see it in front of an audience, usually for the first time and a real audience as opposed to, you know, family and friends and film, you know, they're the guys who are on the cruise. Um, so that's really good and do a Q and A and get some feedback on the movie. That's what a film festival is really good for, for filmmakers to get real third party, um, usually friendly by the way, because people who go to film festivals are usually friendly to independent films. Um, so it's not as critical as if you released your film in the theaters and the critics, you know, took it apart. 
that's a little bit you know more <laughs> difficult. But so a festival is good in that way. Um, my my sort of beef with festivals is two things. One is they're curated really tightly, and you know I believe that festivals make most of their money from from submission fees. I mean, it's somewhere between fifty and hundred dollars for most festivals to, to if you're going to submit a feature. I mean, I've submitted to many, many, many festivals, so I know. And um, you know, you, it's like college admissions. You know, you, like you you add it up. You know, like Sundance, I think got something like thirty thousand submissions last year for a hundred dollars each. So that's pretty good revenue just for submissions. And uh, I don't know if they even need to screen any of the films. So remember, only, and they're only going to accept 300 films. So they're going to accept 1% of what their submissions are. And that's not their fault. Everybody wants to get in there, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's expensive to submit, especially when you're doing multiple festivals. And chances are you're not going to get in. So I have a little bit of a beef with that. It's almost like next time around, I like, you know, I don't submit to festivals usually anymore because the the other because the other reason is is um, when you do get in um, the screenings sometimes aren't very well attended the festivals are you know designed for some of the bigger films and if you're not a bigger film unless you are generating the audience and you know if you're in a city that you know is you're not your local city how are you going to generate audience you don't know anybody you're not going to spend a lot of money on advertising it the festival's supposed to do that. So you can go to a screening and have you know five or ten people there, and you're expecting you know a hundred or two or three hundred and this big Q and A and everything like that, and you know it's usually often not the case. Now you know sometimes it is, and you're excited. And the other thing is, um, you don't get any revenue from your screenings. Like you know, say three hundred people come to your screening and they all paid fifteen dollars to come, um, the festival gets it all. That's the deal. Now sometimes a festival will pay for you to attend. If you're, you know, good sized name director or something like that or whatever, um, but so that's nice. But often they don't anymore because they can't afford it. Um, so, and the last thing is, you know, I mean, it's just about a celebration of art and filmmaking. The festivals, there's really no business there. It costs you to go. It costs you to submit. Um, you have fun doing it and talking to other filmmakers and everything like that. But that's it. I mean, you're not really gonna. Get distribution. The odd time, maybe somebody will talk to you about, about it or something like that. Um, so it's not what people say, and and chances of getting into the big festivals is far and few between. So um, the festivals serve a perfect a purpose in terms of celebrating the art of film, but I don't think they serve much of a purpose in terms of generating revenue. Yeah, I think if you're going for that reason, I think that, that it's you can weigh, do I want to spend the money? Do I want to spend the money to travel there? Yeah. What about people who want the laurels for their film website? Yeah, that's that's also nice. That's fun. You know, so it's nice to win an award. I mean, you feel good. Your ego gets stroked a little bit. Plus, you know, it does help in marketing your film. At least it was recognized by somebody else. Um, it's not tremendously important. It, it doesn't hurt. Sure. It doesn't hurt, but it's not. I mean, you see films that have... 15 laurels on them or whatever and it's still a tough sell yeah you know yeah. sometimes I say <laughs> I used to say this more and I shouldn't really say it but when I was a buyer like in distribution and acquisition executive um, I would attend lots of festivals also right because you know you want to be on the you want to see the films before anybody else sees them so you, you go to lots of festivals watch lots of films and um, sometimes I would walk out of a film in a festival and the audience you know would Depending on the type of audience it was, sometimes when a, a movie's really, really, really popular in a festival, it almost means that it's not commercially viable to go into the mainstream. It's a festival film, and it's designed for that eclectic festival crowd. And um, sometimes it's the kiss of death that it it's you, festival goers don't really like commercially viable films. They don't like what they call these bubblegum, standard, you know, predictable movies. They like something more eclectic and more artistic. So when they love it, it's almost like it's not commercial enough to go into regular distribution. Not always, I, but you know, a lot of acquisition people know that there is a difference between a very successful festival film and a very successful commercial film. Like most real big Hollywood blockbuster movies. Um, they go to festivals because that's because there's the stars and everybody wants to see the stars and and they use them as a as a launch pad, but I mean 
they're not artistic and eclectic enough for the film festival crowd. The only reason they go there is because they, they use them as you know this publicity stunt. But um, a lot of them wouldn't even bother with the festival crowd because um, it's the commercial crowd, it's the ticket buying crowd that they really care about. That's fascinating. And are those those aren't really cinephiles? Those are more people that are going after or before dinner? Well, look, the, the biggest movies are, you know, are the action, sci-fi, superhero. Would you ever, would a superhero movie ever go to a festival? I mean, other than a superhero festival. You know, there's, there are some superhero festivals. You know, Comic-Con has a film, you know, okay. Like, would, would a superhero movie ever show at Sundance? Hopefully not, because that would be, you know, challenge the integrity of the Sundance Film Festival. Why would a superhero, there's no artistic merit, but there's a lot of commercial merit to it, tons of it. And that's going to be the number one blockbuster movie of the season, but yet they would never stick it into a festivals because it's the wrong message. Right, what? unless it was a very eclectic superhero. But if it was, it, was, it likely wouldn't be successful commercially. That's true. Because the people who go to those movies aren't the people who go to festivals. There are some crossovers. I happen to be one of them. But most people are either commercial, you know, moviegoers for mainstream kind of thoughtless, you know, action stuff, or they're very eclectic and want a little more depth and art and, you know, and thought.